Okay, good evening everyone. <clears throat> it's about 6.04 and I'll call our work session, uh, the Burnsville City Council and staff to order. Uh, the city clerk will note that, for the record, that uh, all of council members are present and our leadership team is also present. This meeting is conducted both in person and online. Council members and staff are present here and um, members of the public may attend our meeting um, or watch us on uh, channel 16 or 859 or online at burnsvillemn.gov meetings. And they can also join us on Zoom. Uh, that's zoom.us slash join. And uh, a lot of the information, all of the information is available on our meeting webpage and in the council uh, agenda packet. And this evening, this is the budget work session, and we have just one item on the, this agenda. And Mr. Dan Tinter, uh, our interim finance director, and Jean Bolt, uh, our senior uh, fiscal consultant from Ellers, are present. Dan, your show. Or did um, you want to have any words, uh, Interim City Manager Lindbergh? I, I will kick it off, uh, okay. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mayor Council, thank you uh, again for joining the leadership team in what is now our third budget conversation. Uh, obviously, we are doing things quite differently this year. Uh, we started early. Uh, our entire senior leadership team has been uh, very deeply involved in the budget process to date. Um, tonight, Dan is going to take you through really our goals and objectives conversation as we had it planned. Um, a couple of things to note just, to, to, just ahead of time. Uh, the budget really is a reflection of your strategic priorities and the commitments that we just uh, reaffirmed uh, in January and in February. Um, and staff has taken this work uh, to heart very seriously, and I very much appreciate the, uh, the level of energy, time, and commitment that uh, our busy leaders have put into uh, to the important work of getting us to this point in time. Uh, following tonight's conversation, it's our uh, it's our plan uh, to take the next couple of months, actually, as staff, to really roll up our sleeves and develop uh, an actual budget with some guidance that we'll be looking for from you tonight, uh, particularly. Um, in regards to the remaining uh, ARPA funds that we have available, uh, the general direction of the financial management plan as it's presented, um, uh, and then ultimately just to check in on the questions and uh, additional assessment that you might need uh, as we move forward. So with that, thank you for spending the time doing this. And I also will note uh, that our multimedia folks have worked very hard to set this room up and create an experience where um, uh, the community can tune in live tonight or uh, go back through our budget web page, which is burnsville.gov, burnsvillemn.gov backslash budget, uh, and view this presentation both in video form and also our slide decks as well as our budget portal and interactive uh, and uh, budget participation resources that are available there as well. So uh, thanks to the folks who make this happen uh, as, we, as we talk tonight about your budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um Greg, and thank you to the family members who are around the table for making the time for us to continue our work together because we are always better when we work together to achieve what the community expects of us. Dan. Right. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council, and for the introductory remarks from Interim City Manager Lindbergh. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Dan Tinter. I am the Interim Finance Director and also a Senior Financial Specialist for Ellers. And with me this evening as well as Jean Vogt, a Senior Fiscal Consultant for Ellers who has been intimately involved in the development of the Financial Management Plan. So this evening we're going to provide you with a little bit of an update and then also kind of continue our discussion about the proposed 2023 budget. So just by way of reminder, and Greg already made some of these remarks, but ultimately this evening we are here to continue the conversation from the all-day work session and from our first uh, financial management plan work session, which really was kind of the formal launch of the 2023 budget process. So we're just continuing to have those conversations, as mentioned earlier, about strategic priorities and also organizational needs that have been identified by the various uh, department directors and the city council. I will say as we go through the presentation, you will see some familiar slides. Uh, for points of comparison, we did include some of the information that you saw a month ago, and then we'll show you some of the updated information based on uh, some additional sharpening of the pencil, and then also some questions that the council asked 
during the previous work session. But ultimately this evening, as Greg mentioned, we're here to get some additional guidance from the council on a variety of topics, including the American Rescue Plan Act uh, funds, economic development authority activities. I would note that the previous uh, future meetings list had included a discussion about EDA activities, and so we've kind of married that conversation with the budget discussion because it also is a, a discussion of resources. We'll talk about some property tax levy changes, some potential changes to franchise fees, and then we've also updated some debt issuance assumptions. So this is a slide that you may remember from the previous presentation about some of the key takeaways from the financial management plan generally. Really, as I mentioned, it is about continuing the strategic discussion and the financial future for the city of Burnsville. It leans very hard on the council's strategic priorities and all of the various plans and actions, agreements and what have you that the council has adopted over the last so many years. So in that way, what we're really trying to do, much like any budget document, is weave all of that direction into one coherent financial vision for the community. Additionally, we also want to touch on being an employer of choice. As we've talked at the previous work session, there are many assumptions built into this, and we'll, we'll talk about some of them in a, a little bit, and we'll talk about some of them that aren't included that we know may change the budget process, but ultimately making sure that we're, we're really building on the promise that the organization has made to focus on wellness efforts to support staff development, to provide superior city facilities, and also maintaining a strong complement of staff, ultimately to reduce f city fatigue, and to meet with your organizational value of excellence, that we have the people that we need to accomplish excellent public policy for the community. A few things to touch on. Um, we will talk about this in a little bit. Uh, franchise fees may be inadequate, but we've tweaked some of those assumptions, and we do have some things to talk about to the, the council about that. Additional city debt may be issued to fiddle with some of the property tax assumptions. And right now, we do know from the previous conversation that eight of the funds that were examined as a part of the financial management planning process are in uh, something of a challenging situation, meaning that they've fallen below the fund balance thresholds that Ellers has identified for the various funds. And then right now we know that we've baked in about 12.5 FTE requests, and because of that, and also some inflationary assumptions, that 2023 will likely require a property tax increase of greater than 5.7%. So there were a few very particular questions that were asked during the last work session and just by way of reminder for the group. And these come from some of the discussion in the meeting itself and then also follow up comments and emails from the city council as you reviewed the information, digested, had some additional questions and comments. So the things that we're gonna be walking through in this presentation, really in this order, is what would a more robust economic development fund look like and how would it impact property taxpayers? We're gonna talk about ch material changes to the fund and some of the programs that could be supported as a result and discuss very specifically what happens as far as the rates that would be paid by individual property taxpayers. One of the questions that came up last time is how has recent economic development impacted franchise fees? So we have updated those assumptions, working with community development to identify additional units that will come online in the community in the next five years and we've adjusted the modeling accordingly uh, to capture that additional revenue. And then there was some questions last time about what happens if we fiddle with some of those market value assumptions. You may recall we were including um, a 2% assumption and there was a request for a 2%, a 4%, and a 6%. So we've present, we prepared and we'll present those to you in a few slides here. And an additional question that has come up after the fact is what could the city do as far as additional debt would be concerned to reduce the year-over-year -year property tax levy increase, meaning that you wouldn't be raising taxes to pay for those projects, you'd be borrowing a little money to accomplish it, and that would smooth out some potential increases in the property tax levy. So with a budget presentation, I always like to begin with some economic assumptions, and really it's just the point of the discussion is that the city does not budget or operate in a vacuum. There are federal policies at play, state policies at play, and of course the broader economy that informs many of the assumptions that are baked into the budget process. We do know from the budget projections that are prepared by the state that the state is anticipating a period of economic expansion in both 2022 and 2023. Uh, the state actually uses an outside what they call macroeconomic policy advisor, IHS market, and they prepare a fairly comprehensive analysis that says really in 22 and 23, they're expecting the economy to expand by about two and a half uh, to 2.6, 2.75%, depending on some economic factors. We know recently that the Federal Reserve has adjusted their federal funds rate target. That was the first increase in several years. 
meaning that there is inflation in the economy and the Fed is prepared to respond to that. And as we've talked about in previous meetings, right now the state has a budget surplus of about $9.3 billion. One of the bills that is at play at the legislature that will be of interest, particularly to the city of Burnsville, is about every 10 years, the various organizations that represent city interests come together to fiddle with and rewrite the local government aid formula. The formula that is currently being proposed and is under consideration at the legislature would actually allocate local government aid funds to the city of Burnsville. Coupled with another bill, it would actually increase the amount that was allocated to the formula, and in total, the city could receive really up to about $400,000, depending on what ultimately ends up happening. If that were to happen, it's certainly possible that some of these assumptions could be adjusted to recognize that additional revenue. Of course, we don't know that, and we are in the second year of the biennium, so ultimately the legislature does not have to do anything. Uh, they don't have to adopt a budget. They don't have to adopt any bills. They don't need to do any bonding. They could technically leave and leave it all on the bottom line. So we'll have to wait and see. And then, of course, it should be of no surprise to the group, but there are several factors that continue to create uncertainty both at the federal and state levels, but also here at the local level as we consider fluctuations in the pandemic. I was trying to think of a nice way to say war in Ukraine, but we'll go with geopolitical conflicts. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, the question will be how will that impact things like energy prices? And once energy prices tend to fluctuate and increase, those energy prices are in everything, especially fuel. And once it costs more to truck goods to market, you get inflationary pressures in all manner of consumer goods. So that's something to keep in mind and think about. As I mentioned, there have been shifts in federal policy, uh, both at the monetary level, and then there are still considerations at uh, in Congress for certain fiscal stimulus. And then, as I mentioned, there's, of course, negotiations on the state budget and any tax policy that they may implement. So we'll have to wait and see what may happen with some of those LGA dollars and if there's any opportunity to adjust the budget picture moving forward. This projection comes from Wells Fargo. Uh, we picked Wells Fargo because they are the primary depository for the city of Burnsville. And two things I would highlight for you is what they, the, the consumer price index, or what they call headline CPI, just which is the broadest measure of inflation. And as you can essentially see in the blue box in 2022, in quarter two and quarter three, we are anticipating at this point in time inflation in the 8.2 8 or 7.5% range. As a result, the Fed is actually anticipated to raise the federal funds rate by somewhere between 250 and 275 basis points by the end of the year. Depending on which particular uh, market watchers you follow, that could be anywhere between four to seven rate increases. There is some consideration that the Fed may actually increase rates by 50 rather than 25 basis points, which would be unusual for them. Usually they go up in 25 basis point increments. They could double those moves in an effort to control inflation. And so as you see down here in the federal funds rate target, uh, for the forecast, they're actually predicting the federal funds rate to go up to about 1.19 and then uh, 2.31. Uh, the, the reason it's not in the range is because it does float between the range a little bit. Those are averages over the annualized amounts over the years. Um, this is, at least as far as the federal funds rate is concerned, there may be opportunity for the city to earn greater returns on its investments. It may also accelerate the city's bonding plans as it considers whether or not it wants to bond earlier to avoid these rate increases to reduce interest expense. And we'll talk about some of that when we get into some debt scenarios later in the presentation. But there are some dynamics at play, and the economy could be relatively volatile over the next year, and the city may have to respond accordingly through the budget process and also through some interim actions that the council may take. Uh, we'll talk about one of them specifically when we get to debt and a fire truck that you may be seeing in a in a few weeks here as far as an action that may be considered. So these are just some other assumptions and factors. I won't go through these in great detail because we've talked about some of them in the past, uh, but we are modeling the fund balance amounts that have been set by the council. So really when we're thinking about the property tax levy and the amount of resources that the city needs to accomplish its aims, we're really relying on the council and the policy direction that you have provided. As we've talked about in, a previous, in the previous presentation, Ellers doesn't necessarily look at your CIPs and make, or other plans, and make adjustments. What we do is look at what you've adopted, what your plans are, and then we try to craft financial policies around that. Of course, if those underlying plans have changed or the council has different direction, we can factor that into the model. But we have to start from somewhere, and we don't presume by altering your policy prerogative. We take the information that was had, and so in this case, the best example are the fund balance amounts. We are assuming that we're using that additional two or remaining unallocated $2 million of American Rescue Plan Act funds in 23 and 24, raising those amounts to $3 million. 
and that is a change from the 2020 budget, 2022 budget, excuse me. And then as I mentioned, all the capital projects are funded and we've added in those FTE requests. Uh, the one thing I would mention about the FTE requests too, as we've talked in the past, part of the reason that we've included them in advance of the organizational analysis is twofold. One, to make sure that the council is modeling appropriately and giving the council and preserving your policy prerogative to make adjustments once the organizational analysis is finished and you get that additional information. Uh, but also, the FTE requests that are included in the plan are consistent with requests that the departments have made over a series of years. So we are kind of honoring their understanding and their expertise as it relates to the resources they need to accomplish the city council's vision. A few other things, as we've mentioned, we've modeled all of the growth through 2026 and we'll actually get into some pretty uh, nitty gritty detail about that based on some comments from last time. The 2.5% increase in all of the revenues, 3.5 in expenditures. So we are modeling something that's slightly below inflation. The reason that happens is this is a 10 year plan. And so we assume basically, even though there's inflation can be cyclical, all the things being equal when expressed over a 10 year time horizon, it works out to about 3.5% overall. And then the fund balance amounts. And then this is a change from last time. We are modeling uh, just under $60 million in debt. That's up from $55.5 million. And we'll get to that in greater detail. So as I mentioned, there's a few things that aren't included in the plan. As we've talked in the past, and as the council is aware from previous discussions at work sessions and with other staff, there is potentially a compensation plan and benefits review that will occur later this year. We know that the city is currently doing a space uh, study and looking at its needs for its facilities and that is actually on um, a council work session in the near future here. So you'll get some new information about that. There's a fleet study that is going to be completed hopefully coming up in May. We just talked about the organizational analysis that is ongoing and we do know that later in the summer there will be a park evaluation and inventory to kind of see what types of things and what improvements need to be looked at in the park system. The other thing that I would mention is all five of the city's labor agreements are expiring this year. And so the city will have to renegotiate those labor agreements throughout this budget cycle. And so while we have modeled certain assumptions for wages and benefits, if those agreements settle in excess of that, we may have to make adjustments to the financial management plan and also to the budget. So more to come on those. Uh, hard to know exactly what that's gonna happen. There is some preliminary information that is out there about what we're seeing cities settle at, but we're still pretty early in the year, so we don't have a lot of great comparative information at this point in time. So certainly more to come on all of these in the future. So the first question, <clears throat> what would a more robust EDA fund look like and how would it impact property taxpayers? So before we talk specifically about the activities itself, I think it's worth just reminding the, the group, uh, why does a city have an EDA, or in some cases an HRA, or in some cases a port authority? Different bodies have different powers, and I won't bore you with state law, but they can actually assign all of their powers to each other and operate under one entity if they so desire. Uh, the city has an EDA, but ultimately there are a few underlying policy prerogatives, of course, to advance job creation, Sometimes when economic development initiatives occur, your agreements may include things to add so many jobs at certain wages with benefits or without benefits. So that's a way that the city can encourage good paying, meaningful work in the, within the community. Build and maintain your housing stock, as we've talked in the past, and as you know from your EDA strategic plan, and your uh, overall composition of your tax capacity, most of your value is in residential homes. And so eventually you will have to consider programs to keep up that housing stock and make sure that people have the means to reinvest and protect your property tax base. Enhanced community amenities, you may want to draw certain uh, types of uses or activities of the community and your EDA is a vehicle and has mechanisms to accomplish that. Influencing development activities, if you have meaningful resources, you have the opportunity and the way we've talked about this internally as staff, and you may have heard this phrase before, it gives the council really the ability to control your destiny. You have meaningful resources that you can bring to the table to engage the development community and think about ways that you could bring resources to bear to accomplish your ends. So rather than relying on things such as only your land use powers or um, certain other policies, you may have meaningful financial resources to incentivize certain types of developments. Or as you see in some communities, they will actually buy tracts of land to actually control the development future because the council or the community may have a very particular vision for a certain part of town. Remediate and remove blight. 
you know, we've talked about code cache, for example, and things like that, that you can help to community members to um, maintain their properties and really protect and, and I would say advance your strategic priorities related to community vibrancy. And as I talked about, you also have the opportunity to support the property tax base through reinvestment. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about how some of these things can be brought to bear when we, when we discuss some of the apartments. So where do these programs come from? And ultimately, why are we talking about additional resources for the EDA and the economic and development and redevelopment vision for the community? It hasn't come out of anywhere. It's come from the council and the direction that you've provided, both from what you've heard from the community and staff, and then ultimately what you've adopted in formal policy guidance. So we went back. This is not the total history of economic development and redevelopment of the city of Burnsville, but in the 2000s, you started with the heart of the city. We have the Minnesota River Quadrant, where we have things that are ongoing right now. And then every 10 years, you adopt a comprehensive plan. Those plans contain economic development chapters. And those are very important because, as you know from your interactions with the Met Council, those may drive future development discussions and zoning considerations. 2010s, you updated your plan. In the 10s, and actually in 18, you adopted the first uh, economic development and redevelopment strategic plan, your center village plan. And then, of course, right at the end of the 2010s, you adopted a vision, a mission, and organizational values, and then ultimately strategic priorities, which Greg had just mentioned. Not more than a couple months ago did you look at reaffirm and then also make a few tweaks to, uh, as is your prerogative, to meet the needs of the community. And then we know in, there's also a housing strategy plan, and community development does have planned in 2023, about five years after the adoption of the original EDA strategic plan, an update. So they'll be revisiting those conversations and making sure that the goals that were adopted so many years ago are still consistent with the vision and wishes of the EDA commission, of course the EDA, and since you sit as the EDA, the council. So really when we're talking about resources and programs, what, the, what this financial management plan seeks to do is to bring those types of resources to bear to accomplish the vision that the council has laid down for the community. So just by way of example, here are a few of the EDA strategic plans. You have the actual strategic plan and some goals where you've talked about heart of the city, investing in certain corridors, maintaining the image of the community, wanting to make sure that you're protecting housing and that you have money to assist commercial and industrial enterprises, and you're also making sure that, or wanting to make sure that Burnsville remains a regional destination uh, in the area. That's augmented by your housing strategy plan goals, and we've talked about some of this already, about providing monies for residential homes, marketing and promoting both programs that the, that the community may offer, but also programs that may be available through the county, the state, and other agencies like your nonprofit partners, technical assistance for property owners, helping them understand what types of things could they do to their homes if they wanted to protect their values or improve their resale values and what resources are available. And then something that, it, that everyone is interested to, and we talked about during the all-day work session related to sustainability, are energy efficiency initiatives and you know, how do we make our housing stock and some other uh, community industrial things more energy efficient, more green, more consistent with the council's goals on sustainability. So ultimately, if the council is to realize these items, that the city and the EDA right now lack the funding to achieve that vision. We know from the financial management plans that the reliance on fund balance uh, really has been, has drawn the fund basically down to almost zero. So there's not enough monies to accomplish uh, certain initiatives. And we know that the monies that remain in TIF district number two, which is a pre-90s district, and you may recall we talked about this when we had the conversation about the one-time funding sources, are insufficient to support all of the programs that are proposed by these various plans. Right now, there is just about $988,000 as of the end of uh, 2020 in that TIF fund. And so as you can see below, when we consider and this is not an exhaustive list of all the programs, it's generally in summary form, but we would imagine for residential uh, programs to have rehab loans of various stripes and types, along with technical assistance, if you were being comparable to other communities of your size, and uh, you would be in the $5.2 million range for those items. Commercial and industrial properties, if you wanted to do rehab loans there, or if you wanted to acquire property, this is really where significant resources would be needed. Uh, as we know, Burnsville Center just sold for $17 million. So if you wanted to be involved in those conversations, those are the types of resources that the community would have to have available to itself. It's also um, worth noting that as a part of these plans, 
the city and the EDA in the past have actually adopted a commercial rehabilitation loan program and a building demolition assistance program. There are policies in place, but at this point in time, neither program has been funded by the city council or the EDA. So those programs remain consistent with strategic vision provided by the council and the EDA, and there are vehicles in place to meet the needs of strategic plans, but at this point in time, there's just no money available to put into the community. There are some minor programs, like the code cash, like we talked about, but in terms of the relative amounts, it's, it's I'm, I don't know the right word, but is relatively modest compared to the needs that you see on this slide. So, as I mentioned, other communities have significant financial resources to accomplish their economic development ends, and so we took a look at some of Burnsville's peer and market com uh, communities, and as you can see, Brooklyn Park, uh, having the better part of $35 million in fund balances to accomplish its goal. I know at the all-day work session, we talked specifically about St. Louis Park. And if we were just to crunch the numbers right now, St. Louis Park has about 33 times more in financial resources than Burnsville to accomplish its economic development ends. Um, Edina as well, significant resources. We actually included Fridley, a community half the size of Burnsville, but of similar demographics. Uh, and similar affluence, right now has about $20 million in fund balance available to the EDA. Uh, through its HRA to HRA. accomplish its economic development vision. Um, Coon Rapids, also again in terms of size and demographics, similar to Burnsville, has significant resources. Bloomington looks a little odd on this chart. Uh, Bloomington actually has a port authority. That port authority has many, many as I understand it, pre-90s TIF districts, and those TIF districts actually have pooled among them about $80 million that the city of Burnsville could use to accomplish its, uh, develop, uh, its, its economic development purposes. We excluded TIF districts from this analysis just because they tend to be varied and pretty complicated by city and they're hard to kind of include. As you know from the conversations you've had in the past, there can be interfund loans and things in between them that they show a little, little weird on paper. And then you see Burnsville right now at the end of 2020 had about 700,000 left and that actually will be uh, depleted and by 2024 it'll actually go down to about $50,000 based on the current plan because uh, there is not currently a dish, uh, an inflow of resources to pay for all of the proposed projects. The orange line is actually the property tax levies that have been levied by either the EDA, HRA or Port Authority of those respective cities. Um, and you would use the, the um, access on the right hand side of the chart so as you can see, really many of the communities are levying around uh, $2 million a year. Uh, and as we'll talk about in a little bit, if you were to go to your statutory maximum, you'd be closer to $1.5 million. The last thing I'll say is, ultimately, if you are competing for development and you are attempting to lure certain activities or uses or companies to your community because they're consistent with your vision, these are the resources that would be available to you outside of some other, other options like TIF districts. But these, are, these would be the communities that you would likely be competing with, and these are the resources that they can bring to bear when they have those conversations with those same groups. Mm -hmm. And as we know, these groups shop around. They make phone calls, they ask, and they get very particular. They've, I've even gotten phone calls when I worked for the city of Fridley from developers that wanted to know on a conduit basis if we had any bank qualified bond capacity left. I mean, that's how much they get into this detail and think about ways that they can financially incentivize themselves. So, redevelopment property taxes, as you can see here, this is a breakdown of all of the units that we are currently aware of that we pro were provided by community development, as you can see, between 2020 and 2026, so this is basically a seven year spread, the city will bring on about 1,536 new units of housing. Uh, in total, that will add about, again, in, if I recall correctly, 2022 dollars, about $318,500 in taxable value. And in total, using the 2022 tax rate, they would pay just over $1.8 million in taxes. It's worth noting that those taxes payable would range between $20,000 and about $430,000 between 2020 and 2026. But the thing to keep in mind here is really the relative size. These are impressive numbers, of course, and the city should be congratulated for them. But when you compare the fact that Burnsville's total taxable value is just under $8 billion, all of this development accounts over that seven year period, it really only accounts for about a 4% change in 2022 numbers. Or on average, if you were to break it up from the years, about 
10% per year. So this is another way of demonstrating really how much of your tax capacity is tied up in single family residential homes. You'll add 1,500 units, it will certainly help. It will help spread the property tax burden as you can see by the slide, but weighed against the totality of the taxable market that exists, it moves the needle, but only ever so slightly. So you've seen this slide before. This is the current uh, EDA fund, as mentioned on the slide, it's consistent with the budget book. And right now between 21 and 23, the fund is using its reserves to cover operations, which ultimately results as you see in 24, it's a little difficult to see on the scale, but ultimately the fund has about $50,000 left in it to support the economic development vision of the city council and the community. Right now, the plan does provide for some property tax levy increases, about 100,000 through 2024, and 50,000 year after. As I mentioned though, as far as statutory uh, capacity is concerned with this levy, you have about a million dollars more that you could levy. So right now, as we mentioned, the city just does not have the sufficient funds, and as we talked about last time, the vernacular here is there is not a war chest with regard to economic development. So. Right now, for tax payable in 2022, just under $300,000 for the EDA. And right now, we know we're about 1.1 million below that statutory maximum. As I mentioned on the, during a previous slide, right now, estimated market value for pay 22 is just right around $7.7 .7 billion. The tax rate that is set uh, by the state legislature is that 0.1813%. So really, your maximum levy in any given year under the 2022 assumptions would be about right around one4 million dollars and as we talked earlier right now about every hundred every 250,000 would add about eight dollars onto the median valued residential homestead so the long and the short of it is the city has the capacity to increase its EDA, EDA levy if it so chooses to meet all of its economic development goals and aspirations as outlined in the various plans going all the way back to the 2000s so this is the EDA fund as revised and the recommendation in the financial management plan. Once again, relying on the strategic vision that was provided by the council. As you can see, we can't do anything about the, really the past at this point. We're still using some of those reserves. But then what we're proposing to do in uh, 2023 is to bring that up to a million dollars. So that would result in about a $23 tax increase. And you can see the jump right here in the rate. And then thereafter, increasing it by about 200,000 and then 250,000, it becomes 1.5 million because as we model in that additional growth, it takes you above that 1.4 because you have more, you have more market value uh, when you do this calculation. So basically that brings the EDA to the statutory maximum by 2026. And what that does, as you can see in the slide, is it puts you on pace to have significant resources available. But even with this million dollars, by the end of 2032, you still only have right under $10 million available in the fund. <laughs> Put simply, this is kind of a challenge that has happened, as you can see here, over a number of years, and it's gonna take a few years to undo. The council would have the option, if it's so desired, you could uh, essentially rip the Band-Aid off and go all the way to the statutory maximum next year. If you did that, a median valued home would pay approximately $45 a year at the statutory maximum. So right now, this is a scenario that essentially phases in over three years, but ultimately, it's up to the council, well, the EDA, which is the council, and then the council to ratify, if you so desired, to go with a phased plan, to rip the Band-Aid off and go with the 40, up to the $45 at the statutory maximum, or of course, you could certainly leave the plan as currently adopted and continue on that course. What I would tell the council is that would be inconsistent with the vision that has been provided in those various EDA planning documents. So right now, the, for the EDA fund, there are two recommendations, major recommendations that are outlined in the financial management plan update, and, the, and we would hope to include at the staff level, assuming council is supportive for the 2023 budget is to increase the EDA property tax levy to that statutory maximum by taxes payable for 2026. So the recommendation is currently for that three year phase in and consistent with our discussion that we had about the one time funding sources, 
the council and the EDA would authorize the use of the TIF district funds to support those housing rehabilitation programs, essentially using that million dollars that's available as seed money for those currently unfunded or underfunded programs. So before I move on to the next question, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the group may have, or we can, of course, keep boot scooting. Excuse me. Any questions with regard to the EDA? All right. Okay. So the next question, how has economic development impacted franchise fees and the facilities capital project fund? So you have seen this slide before, just by way of reminder. This is what was presented during the financial management plan discussion. Uh, you'll see here in 2020, there were significant bond proceeds in the fund, which is why the scale looks a little off uh, related to the fire station project. Right now, or at that time, we were modeling about $5.1 million per year in franchise fees, and that amount was held flat. One of the questions that came up that we'll discuss in just a couple slides is what would happen if we included all of that additional development that was discussed in the previous slide, particularly all of those additional apartments. Right now, we know with no fee increases, there's about 3.67 million that is pledged to debt service, and that leaves about 1.43 million after the fact for other capital projects to be supported by the facilities fund. But we know in looking at the financial management plan over the 10-year term, that really the city is averaging about $2.5 million in planned projects over that time. So put simply, there is a structural imbalance in the fund. Your expenditures are outpacing the revenues for those activities. So in the original financial management plan, Ellers had modeled some additional bonding, as you see here, in 25, uh, 29, and 32. And we had discussed that the city may need to explore changes to this fund. And the idea is being that you could increase those franchise fees, you could delay or reduce projects, or as recommended here, you could issue additional bonds to support those projects. But it's worth noting that these additional bonds would not be supported by franchise fees, they'd be supported by property taxes because there aren't enough franchise fees to pay for the debt on those additional bonds. As I mentioned though, when we build a financial management plan, we try to build the financing around the strategic vision of the council, which is why the additional bonding was included. We didn't remove any projects or make any assumptions in that way. So the economic development impact of these additional fees excuse me, these are housing units. Right now, as you see below, the added revenue in really any one year is between $10,000 and $30,000 in franchise fees, depending on when these additional units uh, come online. So overall, it works out to about $111,000 in additional revenue by 2027. It's worth noting, though, that that housing growth really accounts for between 0.2% and 0.65% of all franchise fee revenues that are currently being remitted to the fund. So ultimately, those additional 1,500 units of housing, while important for the community, and will provide additional resources from a property tax perspective and a franchise fee perspective, are not going to give the city enough resources to close the gap with respect to its planned projects and the current inflows to the fund. We do know that the current, res current residential fee is $4 per month. And just by way of modeling, a $1 increase in revenue would raise approximately $600,000 per year, which would effectively solve for the problem. So, so you can see here, we included all of that additional revenue. So that's why this has gone from 5.1 million to 5.2 million in franchise fees. These uh, assumptions remain the same, but we actually removed uh, some bonding and we moved some bonding forward. As I talked earlier about those interest rates, one thing that the city may want to consider, especially with regard to the facilities projects, is perhaps bonding for a portion of it now before interest rates increase and to pay for things like design and engineering and other costs, assuming that the council is comfortable with the facilities project. It is primarily designed to avoid interest expense and not waiting until the end of the year when you're on the other side of potentially 250 and 275 increase in basis points. But the other reason that this is possible, and to respond to a question that came up at the previous meeting, we have actually now recognized and are modeling $420,000 of host fee revenues annually through the projection period. So we are able to reduce the amount of borrowing but borrowing is still necessary because without that fee increase the, or a reduction in projects or modification of projects, the city still can't support everything that is planned without borrowing money. 
It's worth noting that the $420,000 is an estimate. We arrived at that estimate by looking at a projection that was provided to us a few years ago by waste management, and we compared the receipts from last year to the projection and basically arrived at the fact that the city was receiving about 84% of the money that the projection held. So we applied that 84% to next year's projection and we came to $420,000. We rounded it off, obviously. Uh, it's worth noting that that number may or may not be real. The city right now is, begin is in the early phases of negotiating or renegotiating the host community uh, agreement, and those fees may change. There is some discussion and consideration to perhaps increasing the fee, and if the community were successful in doing that, then perhaps these fees could increase. Or they could be a little less. The one thing we do know is that the landfill expansion and what we've heard so far, and I don't mean to speak for Ryan, but in my discussions with him, waste management is currently not planning on trucking more waste to the landfill, in which case we wouldn't necessarily see an increase in the waste stream. It may just remain relatively the same. So the only real increase in fees may end up being the effect of an increase in the actual host fee. Now it's worth noting that that is all predicated on the price of shipping costs, mainly fuel, and whether or not it remains economically viable to send that waste to other landfills controlled by waste management. So more to come, but as we've talked in uh, previous slides and previous presentations, there's still a lot to be decided with what happens with this host fees. Uh, but to the question, and I think to the point raised at the earlier meeting, the city could recognize something, understanding that right now the landfill expansion has been approved ultimately at the state level, and then now there are some land use issues and host community agreement issues to sort through, which are much more in the purview of the city council. So in the event that this number ultimately doesn't work, the council would be well aware of that because you would be made aware of some of the discussions that were happening with regard to the landfill. But it does solve for some of the debt problem. And at this point in time, this model does not include an increase in the franchise fees. So there is no proposed increase in the franchise fees. It's currently factored into this, this long-term financial plan. Um, so, but again, it's predicated on that additional bonding to fill those gaps, assuming the council does not pull back or delay or reduce or change projects. That's of course still your prerogative. So the recommendations in the, in the facilities capital project fund is right now to assign any host community agreement fee revenues to applicable facilities capital projects. Right now we are recommending essentially to assign them to the AIMS Center. That's where the host fees were last budgeted. And we do know that uh, generally, and Gene, correct me if I'm wrong, that for the AIM Center, I believe it's about $500,000 a year on average in capital projects. So it's kind of a one for one. There's still some additional support that's required from this facilities capital project fund. Um, admittedly, and I'll say maybe a little selfishly from a finance department perspective, this, it's easier for us to budget this way than it would be to move the host fees into the AIM Center Fund and then pull all of the capital projects out of the facilities capital project fund and then put them into the AIM Center Fund. It makes the modeling more challenging and it makes um, it a little more difficult to kind of realize everything that's happening with facilities. We could change that approach, it's certainly an option, but for the presentation to the council this evening, we thought this was the easiest way to discuss and understand the effect that the host fees would have on facilities, debt, and franchise fees. Additionally, to issue those $3 million in additional bonds in 22 and 2031. Uh, so as you see right now, one of the advantages of those additional host fees is you do get a longer gap between borrowing. And as we've talked in the past, it does get a little fuzzy as we get to the end of the planning window. So it's worth noting that these assumptions in the long term may not hold and the council and the finance department and the directors would ha have to actively monitor this fund to see if that borrowing was warranted in a future year. But right now to comply with about a $2 million uh, fund balance threshold, that's why the bonding in 2031 is applied. So as I mentioned, there's a few things that the council could do. You could consider those franchise fees in lieu of bonding. It's worth noting that if we were to assume 3% on a 15 year term bond at $3 million, it would, um, it would cost you about $1.35 million in interest expense. So that is the trade off. Uh, essentially, things get a little more costly because you're borrowing and you're paying interest on those, on those monies. And then, of course, you could consider delaying or reducing any of the planned capital projects. And that is certainly a conversation that could be had as a part of the uh, 
ongoing development of the CIP, which because of the revised budget calendar is currently underway. So you can pause if there's any questions about <coughs> franchise fees and the facilities capital project fund. I have a quick question. Yeah. On the on the host fees, what are, how are you determining the length of time on that? Right now, we've just assumed that they would remain available through the 10 years. Through 10 years? Because I know the, the CON is like five to seven years. And I know there's a bill floating around in the, at the state, too, that they want to start, start not allowing landfills to happen any longer in our state. Yeah. Start dumping in other areas of the country. And yeah, it's certainly possible if, as talked about in the economic um, expectation slide, if there are policy changes, we may have to make adjustments accordingly. Uh, or if there are considerations on waste management and about not expanding the landfill in the future or trucking more waste to other landfills. Those are things that will have to be actively monitored over time. But right now it just assumes the 420000 um, which at this point does not model in any fee increase that the council may approve as a part of the agreement. Um, if I'm not saying this would happen, but if the agreement were negotiated at an amount that was similar to the county's fee, these receipts would be 10 times what they are. It would be nice, wouldn't it, to get closer to the county so. agreement? Yeah. Additionally, too, we haven't factored in any inflation as well yeah. in those fees. So if they change over time, because that that is another, I know, consideration of, of a, or a negotiating point for the host fee agreement. And Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but really the approach from the analysis has been um, to use past pattern of what we actually have collected in order to make mm -hmm. a. a a, a best future prediction of what we think, how, how we think it would perform and where we best feel that those funds could, could make an impact or be used. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the $420,000 is based on projection information that we're receiving from waste management and it's been augmented by the city's experience in terms of what it actually received, which has been about 84 cents on the dollar. I'm glad that um, <clears throat> one of the options you have up there is to not raise the host, the, uh, the the franchise fees, because when we did the big lift and the big increase three years ago, and we got some pushback, we told them that we would not touch it for another five and perhaps seven years. So we're still within that range in the promise to the community. So we'll have to sharpen our pencils or take a look at the bonding option that you have in place, or um, we can look at the facilities plan and say, which one should we just do first and wait and plan out the other facilities improvements. So those are some, of, so I like the options that you have. And I think this is where you all will have to sharpen your pencils and come back and make an, a recommendation to us with regard to what that would look like. Madam Mayor, members of the council, to your point, um, Garrett, the leadership team uh, is working with a, a core group of, of folks organizationally to study our facilities needs that will come back to you in your April work session, uh, at least as, a, as an introduction, with a goal that by June, we would be back to you with more detailed information on that assessment. So it's a work in progress. I want to make sure that we, um, keep our word to the community with regard to the um, franchise fees increases. Um, Kara? Uh, last time I had asked if, if we could get the um, two major projects which we've had combined, which is the City Hall and then the next fire station, they've been kept together. Um, do we have that separated out yet? No, I think uh, that's what Garrett's team is working on, I think. Yep, Madam Mayor, members of the council, at this point in time, no. The, the facilities study, the space study, will explore those different projects and will ultimately have some assumptions built into them about what they look like. And then at that point in time, the council could have a discussion about what could be broken out. But we keep getting a, a dollar amount for the combined project. So surely there is a dollar amount for them separated out. Councilmember Schultz. Members of the council, that twenty-six million dollars was a an earmarked um, best guess as we looked at 
at kind of future projections, uh, and that happened now almost two years ago. Uh, so the phase three facilities work that Garrett and the leadership team are working on will identify space needs for facility, uh, for city hall, the maintenance facility, um, the potential for police and fire station number two. Uh, and it will, uh, council member Schultz to your question, uh, divide all of that out, give the council accurate information on what the needs are, um, uh, address what the most pressing needs might be and then that will give us the foundation to appropriately cost each of those four um, which then the policy question back to the council would be what are your priorities what do you want to invest in and my goal would be at the end of the day to identify to the mayor's point what what might we do first and what's our plan to address ongoing facilities needs so uh, so Kara kind of back to your question uh, we we have a reasonable plan forward that we can that we can work into the future, um, rather than just have large placeholders that are, um, at this point, our best guess. Okay. All right. So the twenty six million is a dartboard guess. It was a I would call it a placeholder, Councilmember Schultz. Um, it was uh, our, our best projection with the information that we had um, and then as we got deeper into trying to understand our needs we realized that the space study frankly needed to be redone um, I, I won't go in, I won't opine on my thoughts about that but nevertheless it is what it is uh, and that's where gathering the right information and Garrett uh, taking the lead with the, the leadership team and the organization to, to start doing that work and to get it back to you as part of this budget process, in my mind, is the is the best case scenario for us. Okay. And, and I appreciate that and thank you. And I thank you for the work that you're, you're doing on that. Um, but please do realize that we're being asked to make decisions today based on a large chunk of money and information that I guess we simply don't have. Mm -hmm. So, where do you even go with that? Like, that is that is a, and, and I'm I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that that makes these decisions very very difficult. Do we bond? Do we raise the franchise fee? Do we do this? Do we do that? Well, shit, I don't know because I don't even know what we're going to do. So that makes this exceptionally difficult. Yeah. And as we're still in the budget process, I'm really uh, looking forward to getting the results of your work. And you're in, the, you're in that process right now, correct? Yes. Uh, council member, uh, Mayor and Council Members, one of the things I've shared with the team and our consultant is I want to go through this process for the city without any assumptions in place up front, right? So let our consultants come in, let them do the research and establish what existing conditions are, look at what our constraints are, look at what our needs are, and provide us with some feedback. And I can respect and understand the challenge that you, you talked about, and, and we have the similar challenge. Um, it seems appropriate to understand that if we're looking at a facility study to serve the city for the next 20 years and beyond, there are going to be needs and we do need to establish some high level numbers. At the same time, l letting the consultants determine what their findings are without any assumptions is uh, what we believe is the best path forward. And it, pardon me, uh, about when do we believe that that will be ready for us? Garrett? Yeah, so um, we'll be walking through the schedule on April 12th, um, but right now for this particular meeting, the goal is to, in August, have something that um, is fairly concrete. Uh, again, we'll be coming back to you in June. Uh, so it's April 12th the middle of June, I believe, um, with some more detail, probably more of what you're looking for at that point. 
and then we'll be looking to go back as a team and continue to massage and work that into what we would like to see be a final adopted plan um, that for both of the different studies, right? So we'll bring them together on the same night each time. So you have a big picture of where we're at. Okay, so we'll have some preliminary information in June and then we'll have something more concrete in August. Did I hear that correctly? That's correct. That is the current plan, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then Greg and Garrett, when you all work with the consultant uh, on, on all the facilities and space needs, um, when you have your options, a price point for each, for each of the, whether it's city hall, maintenance center, fire station to uh, police, you know, so we understand and perhaps together, together we can look out and say what comes first, what comes second, and so forth with regard to the financing that we have in place. Yep. Yes. Okay. So, Madam Mayor, to, yeah. to, to your point and Council Member Schultz, to, to your questions, it is our objective to get good information back in front of the Council um, so we can collectively work through a plan to address whatever needs might be identified. Um, okay. I've asked the leadership team and told myself that I'm not going to look to the past. I'm going to look forward in these conversations right. and the reality is to, to these questions. Um, the placeholder is just a placeholder and I understand, um, I, I certainly understand the feedback. Kara, uh, when it comes to making a decision on the on the facilities fund, uh, I will say that um, I've, I've given Dan a little bit of a hard time on this one uh, because I, I I haven't wanted to put unnecessarily changes to the facilities fund or franchise fees in front of you until we have better information. So yes, we have included the four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in host fees. I frankly think that that's a, a wise use given your decisions last year on AIM Center Capital in particular. Um, and uh, I don't want to, much to Garrett's point organizationally, we're, we're telling staff there, there, is, there is no assumption, there's no preconceived notion of where we're going in these projects. That's why we're doing the study. Yes. Um, and I, I want to put equal information or consistent infor information in front of you on the funding side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't want to sound unnecessary alarm bells and I don't want it to be yeah. Painted is too rosy yeah. uh, because there are there are funding challenges yeah. here. Should we assume those placeholders are correct? Yeah. Um, to your point, it's pretty hard to assume those placeholders are correct at, at this time, and that feedback right. is well right. received. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. I I appreciate it again. Yeah. Not being critical, just trying to like figure out timing yep. and yeah. the process. That's what we're here yes. to do. Yeah. So. Appreciate yeah. the questions, Madam Mayor. Keely. My question was the timing. It got answered. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay. I mean, members of the council, I would also add too, right now, um, these, uh, these assumptions assume the $26 million and the recommendations that are proposed by staff this evening are predicated on the $26 million. And so it allows the council to have iterative discussions about the financial position of the city. So right now, as currently constructed, there is no need for a franchise fee increase at $26 million with the additional host fees and the proposed plan. If the plan comes back and it's more, or it's less, likely not going to be less, but we acknowledge a range of options, the council could redirect host fees, reduce borrowing, or if it's more, then consider the incremental steps of perhaps addressing the host fees. So ultimately, I think the virtue of the financial management plan is it puts you in a stronger position to respond to these questions because you're not starting from square one, or you're not sure what the financial future of the city might look like if you did a project. We have a sense. Not exact, we're not too sure, but we're operating from this $26 million number and now you know if you go above or below what kinds of things will be in play as you start to consider the range of options that will be presented by the study. Yep. 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 All right. Yep. So the next question, how do different market value assumptions impact property taxpayers? So for this, I will turn it over to Jean and she will go through it in some greater detail for the group. Mayor, members of the council, it's my privilege to be here tonight, and I'm going to talk about one of my favorite things in the world, and that's property taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on to your hats. How does this work? <laughs> this one? 
Thank you. So we're going to talk property tax basics. Um, we're really looking at some pretty basic steps, but it is a process. So we're looking at certified levies that are coming by these different governing bodies. And as you know, levies are, are done twice a year. There's the proposed in September, and then there's the final in December, right? So every, um, every authority that can levy taxes has to follow those deadlines. Property tax levies are considered a general purpose funding source. They are not obligated um, like some other revenue sources that the city has, which is nice because really what we're looking to do here is fill in that gap. Where does that gap in the, in the funding, right? It's part of the budget process every year. It's spread among all the eligible properties and through a complicated formula. It is complicated. We're gonna talk a little bit about it. I'm not gonna dive too deep tonight because it'll just put you to sleep. Um, but it is ad valorem, and so that means as um, based on value. And as you go through the budget process, it really is th that last step. So you're looking at, you know, what are the expenditures that you're seeing in your budget every year for a variety for all of your funds? What are your other revenue sources that are coming in? And then where are you lacking? And so that's where the property taxes fill in that gap. Um, and there's sometimes there's a little bit of confusion when we're talking about property taxes. The city is only going to get what it levies. Mm -hmm. so, so I think some of the thinking is, is that, oh, my market value went up, I'm going to pay more in taxes. The city is going to get more in taxes. And that's not how that works. So that's a pretty common misconception. So the taxing authorities are only going to get what they levy. And so that's why we have this tax rate, which we'll talk about. So this is what I like to call the three-legged stool. And here, when we talk about the three-legged stool, there's really only one leg that you as a city council or an EDA have any control over. The other two are beyond your control. So the one at the top is the state legislature. They are responsible for establishing uh, the property classes and the property rates and the class rates for each of those different property classes. They determine the levels of state aid. As Dan mentioned, they're looking and, and discussing changes to the local government aid formula. And then they also levy a state business tax. Um, they didn't used to. I was trying to think back today when that happened, and I think it's been about 20 years now. 2000, Jean? I it was the early 2000s. I was trying to remember if it mirrored about the same time as the cl class rate compression back in 03. Yeah. It was about that yeah. same time. Early 2000. Yep, yep, I remember those. Yeah. Um, then we'll talk, the next leg of the stool is the county or the city assessor. So they're responsible for determining the market value of every property under their jurisdiction. And then they take that property and they assign it a class. And those classes are determined by the state legislature and then they take the class rates that are also assigned by the legislature to those properties to get our tax capacity. So really, the only thing that local jurisdictions can do, taxing authorities can do, is determine how much you need to levy. So that's that amount that you backed into, right? Then the county auditor is going to take all that, put in a great big pot, stir it up, press a few buttons, and calculate the tax rate. It's not really that simple. <laughs> So when we talk about how the rate is calculated, though, let's take a look at it, and we're going to do a little bit of a deep, a little bit of a deep dive. So we're going to look at that property, that property value multiplied by that appropriate class rate to get the tax capacity. So we don't have mill rates anymore. Uh oh. Yikes. Yeah. Gremlins. I don't like the talk of taxes. So <laughs> clearly the projector does not want to talk property taxes. No deep dive when you're both. All right. I think it's a nice comment on the equipment we need to replace. <laughs> if it's a bulb, those things are pricey. So we're going to take that market value times the class rate to get the tax capacity. And then what, what the county does is they take up and they add up all the class all the tax capacity for all the property, and that gets us to our starting point. 
of our tax capacity. Now, for the purposes of calculating rates, we're going to reduce that tax capacity by what's captured by tax increment, because those dollars are going somewhere else, right? And then we're also going to reduce it less the fiscal disparities contribution. So fiscal disparities, as you know, we're taking 40% of the commercial industrial value since 1971. And that's going into another pool, right? So that's not available. So then what's left is what we call um, the value for the local rate. And that's going to be that denominator in the, in the formula, the net tax capacity of real and personal property, less TIF, less fiscal disparities contribution. The numerator is what you certified to the county, OK? So let's take a real world example. So here's pay 22. Now this just came out, and everybody got their tax statements a few weeks ago, right? So this is what, what we came up with for, what the county came up with for pay 22 for the city of Burnsville. So here on the left-hand side, we have the tax base. We've got your, your uh, real and personal net tax capacity. That's that beginning one. We're going to reduce it for TIF, reduce it for fiscal disparities, and get that value for the local rate. That's the denominator in the formula. On the right-hand side is going to be your certified levy. We're going to reduce that for the fiscal disparities distribution dollars. Now, that's different from contribution tax capacity. So. Contribution is what you're putting into the pool. Distribution is what you're getting out of the pool. So we're going to take out what's coming from the pool because that's not coming from taxpayers. So that gives us our net levy to the taxpayers. That's our numerator. So the 36 million divided by the 83 million gives you a city tax rate of 43.054. So that's how the county came up with that. So this is a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I thought it might be helpful. For the right-hand side of the page, if you have, if you receive calls from your constituents and you're looking to see what, how to calculate property taxes on a residential property, these are the steps that you would follow to do it. So this is more just as a reference. We'll talk about it a little bit. So but what this is, is we know we have our median valued home at uh, 292400 right, that we've been using? Yeah. And so what I've done is on that right-hand side, calculated out that step-by-step -step how we get to the total taxes. Now, this is the total property tax bill, not including any special assessments, OK? And this is for all taxing authorities. So this assumes that this property is in the city of Burnsville, School District 191, and not in a watershed. OK? So there's five different unique taxing areas in Burnsville. So that's one of the things you need to look at if you're getting a call from a constituent. Where do they live? And a unique taxing area is where every taxing authority overlaps. All right? So we go through, and there's five different steps. Steps one and two calculate the tax capacity. Step three calculates the local tax. Step four calculates the market value tax. For school districts, there's a market value tax. So then you're going to add three and four to get five. OK? So the total taxes on a median, this median valued home are 292.4. The total taxes is 3,052.75. Of that, the city's portion is $1,211.97, or an increase of $78 from last year, which is what we've talked about in the past in the financial management plan. OK? So really, the city's portion is about a third. If you have questions on this in the future, let me know. I'm happy to answer any questions, walk through different scenarios. Um, I have the same thing that's available for commercial. That's a lot more complicated because there's more steps when it comes to calculating taxes on commercial property. We certainly have that available if you want it, though. So now we're going to talk about 
I don't know, was I doing this one or were you? Doesn't matter to me. I'll okay. Do that, but you can. Um, I think at this point I'm gonna hand it back to Dan. Because now we're getting beyond property tax 101, but it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Do you have questions before I hand it back over to Dan? Yeah. No, but that was good, Jean. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, and you know, it's good to go through it again. Hey, I've already, I also took you guys courses again, second time, Ellers finance courses. Took them before, but I took them again for refresher. Well, if it anybody was last wants. Year when we went through the pandemic, and so I decided, oh, I'll go, I'll do the Ellers finance courses again, again. Well, if you really are interested and do want to take a really deep dive into property taxes, um, I am doing a virtual seminar through Ellers with uh, Amy Cothy from Dakota County in early May. And it is a virtual I've series. I've seen that chart that talks about the property tax and then it just goes through all of the configurations and everything and gets that. It's really messy. It is messy. You know, but the counties get there every year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they figure it out. Yeah. So, it, anybody have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and as Jean uh, mentioned, if you're interested, the Ellers property tax is actually Friday, May 6th at 10 a.m. And that's a part of our virtual series. And as a matter of fact, Jean will be doing it, and Amy will be helping out, and then yours truly will be moderating. So feel free to stop by and hear us talk more about property taxes. <laughs> I will, I'll make sure that we share more specific information with the council on that if you're interested uh, in my updates to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by way of reminder, this is from the financial management plan presentation, and it is the modeling of the financial management plan of the 5.7 annual increase that was originally included in the 2022 budget and the, through the 2026 financial plans. As, so as you can see, and as we've talked about in the past, what ends up happening in these scenarios is the additional property tax revenue is not sufficient to prevent the city from going below its fund balance threshold over the five-year period. So what ends up happening as fund balance goes down in 2027 is when you see a drastic increase because the way the model works is it essentially puts the city back to the 45% for the community as established by the city council's uh, discretionary fund balance policy. You may recall you have a little nuance in your fund balance policy where it's 40 to 50. You try to keep it at 45, and then anything between 45 and 50 you can use for discretionary items. So in this model, we use that 45%. Uh, what ends up happening is uh, once you uh, go below that threshold, there is this rather large increase. Uh, if I recall correctly, Jane, I believe it was 26 or 28% off the top of my head. Something like that. Year over year. And then, as Jean just mentioned, fiscal disparities kicks in, and you're on something that Jean would call the fiscal disparities roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And that's why your property tax then rate and amounts get a little volatile over the next couple of years, and it actually takes about four years for all of that to sort itself out. So you end up having, uh, because of the, or if I'm wrong, because of the contributions and distributions that end up happening, you get things get a little wonky. Um, it has to, there's a one year delay yeah. when calculating the fiscal yeah. disparities distribution dollars. Yeah. So because of that one year lag, yeah. you know, you're using the prior year's rates. So if you have uh, your normal tax rate for the prior year when calculating for 2027, that's going to, because you're doing that big jump you know, in the levy to correct for that 40, to get you back to that 45%, what that's going to do is that's going to send your tax rate up. So that higher tax rate then is going to be used when calculating the next year's fiscal disparities distribution dollars. So your distribution dollars will be higher the following year, which will bring your tax rate down. Yeah. So it's because of that one year lag. It takes about, as Dan mentioned, about four years to get off the fiscal disparities <coughs> register once you're on it. But always remember it's only what we levy. Yes. The rate, yeah, is something different than what our levy is. Right, but because of fiscal disparities, it's going to impact yeah. the levy, the, the portion that's being uh, going to the taxpayer. Yeah, TIF and fiscal disparities. Dan K. So I understand that spike in 2027 is driven solely on the ideal of 45% mm -hmm. um, 
fund balance, right. not yeah. costs are part of that, but obviously there's a fund balance remaining. Um, and so since we've lived on 35% for many, many, many years before we moved it up when we were quite frankly just flat out flush with cash and could do it, if we decided in that year that we wanted to hit 35%, what does that impact? What does that make that levy year? I think on this one it's twenty three percent in your model. Yeah, something along there. Yeah. We can look. Um, so, uh, well, just to finish, I would not ever vote for a levy that high. Number one, but not certainly not based on just trying to put more money of taxpayer money in reserves, right? That seems ludicrous to say we're going to jack our levy up 23% so we can have a boatload of money sitting in a reserve account not being used. Talk about an example of excess taxation for no reason other than, well, we just want to have a lot of extra money in the bank, right, over what uh, the state statute requires us. So I, I didn't realize that when we first went through this that that was what that was based on. I thought this was driven by hard costs. It like, is? like hard costs, not in addition to that. Staffing. I thought it was, yeah, it was pure, you know, we need more staffing, we have these hard costs, this is what we want to try and get to. That was driving that levy, that 23%, not, well, we need that, plus we want to get back to that 45%, so here's an additional several points that we need to take from taxpayers just to get that extra cushion, right? Is that, am I not stating it correctly? I want to make sure that I'm, we're very clear, because we're on camera, and we're talking about real dollars. Sure. Madam Mayor, members of the council, so it does include hard costs because your fund balance is a function of your revenues and your yeah. expenditures. And you so we've built in assumptions over time about the amount of revenue that the city will take in and the, ex and the amount of outlays that the city will have. And then the remaining balance, if there is, would fall to fund balance. If there's not, you have to rely on your fund balance to make up the difference. You have a deficit spending situation. The model is designed to basically demonstrate what would be necessary over time to get you back to that 45% number that has been adopted by the city council. Uh, it is important to note that that 45% is a little more than just having money in the savings account. It, it accomplishes a few things. One, it protects your bond rating because the city needs to have a certain amount of cash on hand in order to settle a certain amount of debt. When those calculations are done, they look at your all of your um, net debt and things that are subject to your statutory limit and they look at what you have in cash and cash equivalents and they do some calculations and they figure out kind of what are different debt measures as a result? So things like debt per capita and debt per household and debt against assessed value and things like that. So it's, it's a very important consideration for rating agencies when they assign riskiness to your bond, which can result in you paying more interest costs if you're in a lower category because a lower credit rating basically means you're at greater risk of default so the market demands more interest. The other thing that happens here, especially with property taxes and fund balance, is you really only receive two distributions of property taxes in a given year. There are some, some short settlements that happen through the course of the year, but really where that kind of 40 to 50% comes from is you get the money from, this, from the county and then you basically ride it for a period of time until you get the money again. And we could actually look at the city's cash flows and you would see that essentially it goes down, then there's distribution, it goes up, it goes down, there's distribution, it goes down. And that's basically to make sure the city as a going concern can continue to pay its bills. The reason it's not always 50% is because you do get other revenues for like fines, fees, parks and rec, building fees, things like that. So you do have other things that feed into your cash flow. But really it's to make sure uh, that the city doesn't ultimately bounce any checks. Right. The last consideration for the fund balance and the reason to have it at some amount like that is of course to plan and be, um, be able to respond to unanticipated or sometimes outright emergency situations where you have money in the bank essentially to pay for certain things uh, over time. Or if you have a cost overrun, a good example, in the recent pandemic, a lot of cities had to look to their fund balances because they were concerned about things like parks and rec revenue falling off because they weren't going to do any programs and they knew that they were going to have to use those additional resources. So it's a little more than just having kind of the money in the savings account, there's a variety of reasons mm -hmm. why it exists, some that are beyond your control, like with rating agencies and um, how the county distributes property taxes. And it, it is, to your point, a question of risk tolerance with regard to the city council. I can tell you that the 40 to 40, uh, 40 to 50 percent is consistent with the Government Finance Officers Association's best practice, and it's also a recommendation of the Office of the State Auditor. Okay. Well, so, so I'd like 
in a future presentation, just for ref historical reference, we lived on 35% plus 2 million uh, for years, many, many years. And we had a fund balance that exceeded that. We weren't working on strictly percentage. We converted to that. But I don't know, looking back, what was 35% plus 2 or 3 million? What did that equate to? 40, 41, 42? You know, was, what was that percent? Since that's the scale that we're using today, I'd like to see just the last, you know, go back maybe before we made that decision, a five year period when we were operating on that 35% plus a couple million for emergencies, you know, crises, natural disasters. We kept that fun uh, ever since May 98 storms, wiped out a bunch of trees and we needed to uh, uh, step in as a city. Um, but I don't know what that percentage equates to. So I'm thinking, okay, 45, you know, 45 to 50 range or 45, and we were at 35. But well, we were 35 plus a couple million, so I don't know what that couple million equated to in percent. I would just like to know that for historical reference yeah. to understand. It seems to me when we converted, I was paying attention to these numbers, we were pretty flush with cash and we were way over what we had historically ever been. And so we basically moved the bar from 35% plus 2 million to 45%, which was a pretty significant jump. And that's, that was kind of my feelings behind this. Uh, chart saying we need to be at 23% levy to get back to 45% because I know that 45% is significantly higher than what we've ever been historically. And we held a AAA bond rating with 35% plus 2 million. So I don't know that it requires 45%. I don't think that's really what you stated. It's just a range that is recommended, right? Yeah. And, the, and, and I know that when we lived on that 35 plus 2, we were always sort of at the minimum, right? That 35 was state statute, right? And is it still state statute, 35 percent reserves? I don't believe it's a state statute. It's not. Or, or maybe a, a finance office recommendation, like cities can't go below 35 percent. There was something that was told to me by our prior city managers. More. Well, than I can one. tell you that there are there are GFOA best practices and there's OSA guidance on what a city should be at. So that may be what was being referenced. Maybe what? Yeah, it, it guided this city for a long time. And Madam Mayor, you've been around longer than me. I mean, it was 35 percent plus what we felt was a better cushion for emergencies, because we didn't really want to ever have to go below that 35. And so it, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from when, when we're talking 45 and historically where we lived with a AAA bonding for a long time at 35 plus a little, and that plus a little that we felt was important to keep for emergencies was actually giving us cushion, right? We looked better in that bond rating review because in our minds it was for emergencies, but to the bond reviewers of, oh, you're, you're carrying a few more million than the than the 35%, right? Which just made us look better. And we were always challenged with pressures, structural pressures also. But, you know, we need our finance director to guide us and to help us to understand what the best practices were. But we were never <coughs> given that information until recently. So, Greg, you had your hand up. And well, it, it, Council Member Keeley, members of the council, to your to your question, uh, perhaps, Dan, you can capture in summary version, um, and if we have to wait for a future session, we certainly can, but uh, the past several years, we have certainly spent down fund balance as a result of the, of the pandemic and uh, the financial situation that we find ourselves in, policy direction uh, included. Um, can, you, can you speak to the Council's current policy and kind of try to weave the conversation back to Councilmember Keeley's questions now, or do you need some time to do that? Uh, I may members of the council, I can certainly speak to it. Uh, some of the perhaps particular information, if there are more detailed questions, we may have to circle back on. So right now, the city's policy as established, as I mentioned, <coughs> is the 40 to 50 percent. Uh, there's a nuance in the city of Burnsville's policy that essentially says when you're above 45%, anything above that can be used for discretionary one-time costs. Um, so put simply, you wouldn't necessarily need to have that 45%. You could go down to 40. Um, and then over time, the city has been spending down fund balance. Under the current 2022 budget and the financial plan, the city over the five-year period would not ultimately violate the lower fund balance threshold. Uh, what Ellers has done through the financial management plan is done two things. One, extended the term of the projection to look over a longer period of time, and also applied more evenly across all costs, inflation. 
and as a result of that additional inflationary pressure, the 5.7% then causes the city to start to dip below fund balance. And Gene, if I recall correctly, to go as low as uh, what amount again? I believe it's in the in the low 30s or. I let me take a peek here. I'll tell you. And so what ends up happening is under those scenarios, that's what then results in this in this increase. Uh, so ultimately, <coughs> the city could, if it wanted to opt for a lower fund balance threshold. Ellers would not recommend anything below 40%, uh, but that would probably be closer to the 35 plus 2 million that you would describe yeah, previously. But again, as we talked about in the past, these models are predicated on the policy of the council. And so that's why it's informed in this way. And to your point, the council could change the policy if it decided at some point in time in the future that if it ever found itself in this scenario that it wouldn't necessarily do that. Now, ultimately, what would end up happening is these rate increases would likely be spread over time, and that's what we find in a few later slides when we'll talk about kind of divvying this up over several years in order to avoid those larger than usual increases. And I think, like anyone would want, myself being a property taxpayer, is to keep the property tax rate stable and predictable so people can be thoughtful and considerate with their personal finances and knowing what their costs would be. This is, this is, by definition, a scenario that's designed to make a point, and I think ultimately make it easier for the group to conceptualize what would happen in a worst case scenario. Does that get to your? Yeah. Absolutely. Dan Gustafson. Uh, Dan, um, I'm assuming in 2027, our uh, cost of doing business will have gone up quite a bit in the city over the next five years. And which tells me if we're even if we're at a 35 or 40 percent, we're still going to see an increase in that excess money, or not excess money, but but in the in the reserves to cover, it, it included the, the more expenses that we have. And we're sitting here, we're talking about hiring a lot of employees over the next five years and doing a lot of different things around here. That's going to bring up our cost of doing business, which is means we have to, we have to bring up our, our reserves as well in order to cover that for. From what I understand, with the reserve, sometimes it's really a matter of us making payroll and things like that toward the end. And so, Mayor, members of the council, yes. So, a few things that will happen over time. This model includes a 3.5 percent inflationary factor. So, as those costs increase, your fund balance is a function of your expenditure budget. So, over time, that fund balance threshold, the actual amount of money would have to increase for that percentage to hold, to be held at a constant. Additionally, if you bring in additional costs like the additional approximately 1.5 million in FTE costs, that would then also be factored in and you would have to adjust your fund balance amounts accordingly. Okay. Again, to Councilmember Keeley's point, depending on what that threshold actually is as a matter of policy for the city council. Pull some fund balance numbers. Right. So 30% in 2026 with no new FTE, so under this scenario. Right goes down to 30 percent so in this scenario it would still be below the 35 plus 2 million that you described before in what year was it? In, in 2026 2026, 2026 gotcha. then what is the other one five percent that's with the new FTEs included oh if you include the FTEs and you stay at the 5.7 percent it would go down to five percent by 2026 oh, <laughs> to council that's even a worse scenario scenario yes. Expenses would be significantly higher. Yeah, of course. Right. We'd have to have some. We wouldn't let that happen. So then by way of reminder, uh, this was the impact on a median valued home from the financial management plan work session. We had talked about the new development, which was factored in through 2026 based on the information provided by the new development. We had assumed that 2%, uh, and we do have a couple models after this where we model 4 and 6%. Uh, but then you can see based on those additional FTEs and the inflationary pressure that exists in the financial management plan, in 23 you have a 10.9% increase and then 10.5 and then 13.6. And then in the out years you return closer to that average that you had seen uh, before those kind of three years of additional property tax pressure. So just by way of reminder as well, uh, right now we are making some movements with the general fund with respect to FTEs. Mm -hmm. The first is we're moving communications personnel 
uh, from the basically cable television franchise fee fund into the general fund, and that's primarily because that fund is structurally imbalanced. I think everyone is aware of the cord cutting phenomena and some of the regulatory challenges that make it more difficult for cities to raise cable television franchise fees. And so since that fund was challenged uh, as part of the 2022 budget and the financial plan, uh, the council actually has already kind of discussed and reviewed uh, and approved in the first out year that move. And so the model does, can, does keep that moving forward. And then right now we have 38 staff positions programmed over the four years. We had talked about the 12.5 already, which are approximately 1.5 million. It's worth noting that these are only tax supported funds. And right now there are another three FTEs that would be planned for uh, 2023 as a part of the utility fund, specifically for public works. So these are the these are the amounts that have been factored into the plan moving forward. So Dan, uh, before you get to that takeaway, just for uh, explanation purposes, to Councilmember Keeley's questions on fund balance and the first 5.7 percent impact on the median value chart uh, that raised some of his questions with kind of the um, the, the steep changes in tax rate. Um, uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, this visual represents what the financial management plan attempts to do uh, to avoid that scenario as it was presented in March. Um, and certainly we can follow up with additional um, fund balance information should it be necessary uh, in, in order to even out and deal with the pressure that has been identified through the work of the financial management plan. Is that a fair summary for folks at home? At this point in time, yes. So this, uh, as discussed at the financial management plan work session, basically assumes those FTEs, assumes the additional inflationary pressure across all of the city's operations, especially as it relates to the general fund, and considers that 45% percent balance threshold. All of those are woven in to these numbers. Thanks for the clarity. I just thought it might be helpful to make sure we're talking from the same of course. place. And so these are the uh, additional FTEs, and as I mentioned, there are a handful more that are in factor in each of these years that are in the enterprise funds that aren't reflected in this discussion since we're talking specifically about property taxes. And the, the thing to always keep in mind here is really 75% of the general fund expenditures are FTEs. The rest are the current expenses, the materials, supplies, contracted services, what have you. So to Councilmember Gustafson point, since most of the general fund is already FTEs, if we add more FTEs to the general fund, then those fund balance amounts would have to change accordingly because they will be a function of the expenditure budget of the city. So this is the tax base growth history, and this is admittedly a little bit of a difficult uh, table to read, but based on the feedback we received from the council at the previous meeting, you had asked kind of what was, has happened since about 2010 and what things have occurred with respect to your tax base over time. So as you can kind of see in 10, 11, 12, and 13, uh, actually there were contractions in the tax base as a result of the Great Recession and the impact on values. And then really in 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 is when you saw coming out of the Great Recession and some of the expansion of the tax base. And then depending on the community, most communities got back to their pre-recessionary levels in kind of this 18 to 19 range. And then depending on their makeup, sometimes in uh, 20. So really it took quite some time to rebound from the contraction in the tax base. And then as you can see and as we talked about at the uh, previous meeting in, in 22 and 23, you do have so about a 14% increase and then there is a 5.4% a increase. So these are the changes that ultimately then impact that formula that Gene went through in greater detail in terms of calculating what the actual tax rate ends up being, that denominator for the uh, overall tax capacity. To kind of make this a little easier to read, your 13 average in terms of taxpayer and tax base growth is just under 3%. 10 years, kind of four and a half, and then eight years, you see that 6.2, and then seven, and then, sorry, five, uh, right around that 7% as you get into the tail end here. And then there's, this is, these numbers actually really more pushed up by uh, this number over here. So you can see really historically, over the last 10 years or so, you've really been in the 2 to 5% range, which then it kind of informs Eller's assumption, the long-term financial plan, about the 2%. So as you can see, though, as you look through this, a majority of the growth has been in residential property, particularly with apartments 
appreciating the most in value. Plus, you do have all of the new additional apartments that are helping. Um, you, of course, have an electronic version of this, so you can look through this in greater detail. It's admittedly pretty difficult to read, but since the question was related to the long term, we wanted to make sure that it was available to the council and the leadership team. Yeah. And of course, anyone watching at home. Dan King. Yeah, I just a note to Tom, you need to submit for a larger screen, because this is, <laughs> from this distance, it's a little hard to read. Councilmember Keeley gets back to that whole uh, facility stuff. <laughs> yeah, that or we need to get a lot closer. We're having that seem like a mile from each. <laughs> we need to tighten this up. This was definitely under the guise of providing the maximum amount of information that was requested, yeah. Yeah. and and really to help you uh, understand why we're, why we're making some of the assumptions we're making and what's informing some of the property tax assumptions over time. And uh, just a quick quick clarification: your uh, prior slide that had ten ten. 13 for the levy plan. Mm -hmm. That also assumes using 3 million in ARPA to buy down 2023 and 3 million to buy down 2024, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, as, uh, as requested, this is the annual kind of 2%, and this is the same model that was used before. We have made some adjustments based on the conversations we've had, particularly as it relates to debt and how we can smooth the property tax levy over time. So as you see here, um, right now with some adjustments that have been made in the last month, the new recommendation <coughs> would essentially be a 10.0 increase, a 10.1% increase, and then 11.7 in 2025. This responds directly to the question that we'll talk about in a little more detail in a second here about the additional debt that could be brought online. So what we did at Ellers is we went through the financial <laughs> management plan and the CIP and tried to identify additional projects that would be good candidates for bonding and added them to the scenario. Uh, and as a result, we were able to reduce 2023 by basically a percent. Um, there are, of course, some other considerations, as we talked about in the previous slide, about the organizational analysis and the facility study and fleet and what have you uh, that may impact this number overall. It's worth noting that this 10% does include all funds that have property taxes directed to them. So it's not just the general fund, it's also all the capital project funds and your debt levies. Elizabeth? Well, I have another yeah. question. MG. That, that three million that Councilmember Keeley brought up, two million of that's already was approved in the 2022 budget, was it not anticipated? And so yeah. what we're really talking about, an additional million dollars a year for two years to do one-time spending in the city. So the, Am I correct in that? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's how I understand. Council, Council Member Gustafson, Council Member Keeley, to your question. Uh, generally speaking, for the viewing audience at home, the simple version is the plan that was adopted uh, for the 2022 budget allocated $2 million of ARPA funds. The city received about $8 million in total allocation that will be provided to the city in essentially two distributions. Yeah. Uh, we've the first tranche. Yep, so we, we're, we're maintaining a, a, essentially a fund that will house that money. Council Member Gustafson, you're correct. Uh, for the 2022 budget, $2 million was allocated for revenue recovery. For, and then for the next two years, the assumption was an additional $2 million per year would be allocated, again, for revenue recovery, about $6 million in total, leaving the council about $2 million in ARPA funds yet to be allocated. The financial management plan that's before you tonight assumes that that additional $2 million is used for, uh, for revenue recovery and is reflected in the numbers that are in front of you right now. Said another way, uh, all ARPA funding is represented in the 2023 estimate at 10% by the financial management plan uh, for that, that particular scenario. So the recommendation of staff uh, is reflected in the financial management plan and as we've talked about, that's the direction that we're seeking tonight, whether that is agreeable to the council or not. And one clarification, it's in the 23 and 24 for both years. Three million and three million up from the two million and two million. So what would happen in a 4% scenario, so if we were to increase a little bit, what actually ends up happening here is, as you'll notice, the percent change in the levy doesn't change really at all. What ends up happening is because of the math that Gene had explained, there's actually an increase in the median value of the home. And so more of 
uh, uh, property tax actually increased because the value of the home is increased. And so they're paying more money on that additional value. It's not necessarily in this situation a function of the levy itself, which is of course factored into it, but since that amount is increasing over time, they just end up paying more because their house is worth more. And so as you see, it goes from 118 up to 121 in 2023. And then of course, if you go to a 6%, the same kind of dynamics hold, and it goes to 125. There may be some scenarios in the future where if there is additional and meaningful expansion in commercial industrial uh, properties, reaching back to our discussion about the EDA, those do pay a higher class rate. And if there's more expansion in your tax base in those areas, then perhaps some of these residential amounts could come down. But again, your tax base is disproportionately residential, so that would have to be a significant expansion. But it would be one of the arguments for additional economic development activities with respect to commercial and industrial properties. Madam Mayor. Yeah. Uh, and maybe uh, interim city manager Greg Lindbergh. I got all the words out. Um, uh, could we, you've, you've said a couple things here that uh, I just want to get clarity on for whether the amount of tax that we levy to a property owner is based on a comment that I've heard the mayor make many times and I've repeated many times over the, over the years strictly based on what our costs are. Uh, so we're levying a dollar amount. We are not levying a mill rate or a tax rate. No. Those are equations that come out yeah. at the end. Correct. But what we are saying is we need X dollars more. Doesn't matter if your property grew 20%. If we only need 6% more, we're gonna levy 6% more than last year. And, and, and as the apartment <coughs> fluctuates, that, that affects their, their end result. But ultimately, in simple terms, if nothing changes, um, we're going to levy 6%, even though their property went up 12% 12, 12 every year. Um, but one of the things that in your previous equation with the county, and I thought you just validated that with one of your statements, it's taking that pie, that tax capacity, and running it through a formula and coming up with a dollar amount, which tells me it's actually coming through some form of a mill rate based on valuation increase, as opposed to this is what we levied on your property last year, and the city said it needed 6% more, so you're, you're gonna, your city bill is going to be 6% higher, regardless of the property value change, right? Not quite, no. So it's not 100% that statement, I guess, put it that way. Well, we, um, Councilmember Keeley, um, Minnesota hasn't, it doesn't use mill rates anymore. So a mill is per, uh, per $1,000 of value. A factoring, right. Right. So it's per $1,000 of value. Because we switched to this tax capacity, so the way I, I like to describe this best is I like to use a waterbed scenario. <laughs> Stay with me. So the water in the waterbed is the levy, okay? And so if you push down on one part, it's gonna go up somewhere else, right? So it, depending on where market bar values are at, if there's a greater increase as we saw in the histor history of, of where those growth values are happening, whether it's happening in residential, whether it's happening in commercial or apartments, that's gonna play a factor in what's gonna create that tax base, that denominator, right? So when we look at this, when we go through this exercise, we're making a couple of assumptions here. So when we do this calculation for the two, four, and the 6% increase, we're making the same assumption that, you know, that the total tax base increased by 2% or 4% or 6%, but we're also making an assumption that that median valued home is also increasing by 2% or 4% or 6% when, for the purpose of this exercise. And so as you can see, the changes really aren't significant, it's like two or three dollars a year. Um, so what we're saying is that when, when the whole tax base rises, how much you're going to pay is relative to how much your market value increased in relation to everybody else's. So if, if your property went up 8%, or if you had new construction, you know, put an addition on your home or did something, right? So that's gonna mean that your value is going up more than the average. So that means that you're, you're, you have a slightly, slightly larger slice of the pie. The base, right. 
right? So that's kind of how we need to take a look at it. So it's not just that my market value went up, I'm going to pay more taxes. Well, it's kind of my, how much did your market value go up in relation to the rest of the tax base? Does that help? Yeah, I think it, it I mean, it, so there, it really is both, right? We may say, um, you know, our, you know, our levies, you know, 30 million, and now it's going to be 6% higher than that. And then we allocate that across the base. Right. So we still are levying a hard number, but the yes. end result on each individual property is influenced by those other factors, as you noted. And so there's a possibility that a person who's had some additions and valuation enhancements will see greater, if, if ours is six, they might see greater than six, but that's because of other factors within that pie. Right. Not, not the city saying, well, you went up 12%, so you get 12, you know, so you get a, right. a bigger piece. So right. that, that goes back to that three-legged stool. You only yeah. have control over one. one component of that. Right. Just Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that that is, the, I think that's worth repeating in the conversation that really the council's, the council's decision on levy is just about the levy amount. And the council, just the amount. back to Dan's earlier point, the council gets what it levies. Uh, and those other factors that you just described, Dan, uh, are, are exactly then the other pressures that go into the nuance of, of how that total bill is calculated, in our example, for a residential property taxpayer. Uh, we just levy what we need to run the city. Mm -hmm. and, th and I will s say just for the sake, I'll pass along a often repeated comment from a resident. I got my county tax bill in and it went up 20%, and now you're saying there might be a 10% increase on top of that. No, it's not, it doesn't work. And I said, don't, don't worry, it doesn't work that way. I don't know why your house went up 20%. Correct. You must have done something really great. Uh, mine only went up 7 or 8%, the way it's been going, which most of the market, right? So in their circumstances, but they believed yeah. that we operate on a factoring or a mill rate. That, right. that it was, you know, that it was going to go up 30 percent. They're 20 plus our 10, right? Uh, as a factor of, of their increase. So um, it is a common misnomer. I think most people just somewhere along the line, they've been trained to think that all cities are the same and it's all based on a mill rate or a percentage and it's and it's based on the value of their house. So when it went down 10 or 15 or 20 percent during the Great Recession, they really came into City Hall and complained, why aren't my taxes going down? My property value went down. Right. <laughs> yes. Well, so did everybody else. So did everyone else. It's actually yeah. a very good example. Yeah. 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 Right. They, everyone sort of believes yeah. a myth, really, yeah. in, in our case. It, it is yeah. done that way in Missouri and other states. But um, So we're in this constant education of we only <laughs> levy a hard dollar amount, and what happens to your valuation of your home isn't in our control. That's right. Yeah. And, and what I would recommend to, uh, if you do have those conversations, now the tax statements have just come out, so people are looking at this information and it's fresh in their minds still, yeah. is there's, there's two things that they got in the mail. One was their tax statement, the other was their value notice. <coughs> so it's important to know that, you know, you cannot contest your taxes, but you can contest your value. That's right. And on the value notice are the dates and the times for appealing your value, starting with open to book. To the county assessor. To the county assessor. So it starts with open book, and then it goes to Board of Equalization. And then there's other uh, avenues available beyond that, which you pr would need to talk to the county about. But if you believe that your property, the value that the county has on your property is outside the range of 90 to 105% of what you think the property would sell on the open market, yeah. then, then you can have, you know, you gotta do your homework, you gotta look at the comparable sales, what's happening there. But then you can take that to the county, and they will work with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And I would add to Gene's comments. Um, when I worked at the city of Fridley, we had a city assessor, and we would have people come in, and he would sit with them and go over the data and make adjustments accordingly based on the information that they provided. So it can happen. Mm -hmm. The other thing to keep in mind, too, uh, Madam Mayor and Councilmember Keeley, is if you do have residents that are experiencing larger than usual property tax increases, there are two refund programs available at the state. There is a regular refund, which is means tested, so it's a function of their income and they can get some of it back. Uh, and then there's also one that is a special refund, which basically says if the value of your home increases by a certain amount, and that increase is not attributable to your activity, meaning you didn't pull a building permit and put in a new bathroom and stuff like that in a kitchen, you can get a portion of it back. 
Uh, and you can always it's refer. good information for us to continuously have every year during mm -hmm. this time. So when we do get um, some complaints from our residents because they don't have, they have a, a fixed income. Right. And there are these programs where they can get. Well, and even in, even in that special program that Dan just mentioned, it's a good reminder, and I'm really glad our communications director's in the room. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a good reminder that, that, that that's something that we can weave into our communication as well, right? Yeah. To make it easy yeah. uh, for our property taxpayers to know that there is state programs that are non-means tested, meaning if there is if there's value attributable not to any of your own doing, uh, that you are eligible for a state program. Yeah. I, frankly, I don't know that I was completely aware of that ahead of this year. Yep. So yep. Um, it's good information. Yep. So if your value goes up at least 12% and $100, so you have to meet both of those tests, and you know that 12% is not due to uh, any new improvements, then you can apply for that through the special refund uh, through the Department of Revenue's website. And we'll make sure that we uh, weave that into how we help our, our property taxpayers. And Madam Mayor, members of the council, feel free to send people to the finance department. We're happy to help them locate the documents. Great. Um, we can only help them fill it out to a point, especially on the regular refund. We don't necessarily want to be custodians of their financial information and things like that, but we can certainly connect them to the people that they need to talk to at the department. Point them in the right direction. Yeah. 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 Kara. Uh, does that also fit with the waterbed model? Because if you push down someone paying revenue in one place, it has to be made up in another. So, Madam Mayor, members of the council, so they will still pay their property taxes, they get money back from the state. No, I agree with that, but like we, we also pay money into the state, and so they take money from us to then pay back in this program. Like, we're in a self-contained system here, right? So. While I agree that is, it, that is helpful on the individual basis, um, there is no free lunch. So that money is going to come from somewhere and it's going to come from Minnesotans. Madam Mayor, members of the council, certainly could be the case. I don't know what the financing vehicle is for those programs. If it's a general fund appropriation and then be funded by like income and sales taxes and things like that. Yep, could certainly be the issue. Okay. Okay. So those are the various uh, scenarios. <laughs> One other thing I would add to Gene's comment, um, for those of you that know Matt Smith, who is the Dakota County Manager, he used to be the Minnesota, yeah, used to be nice. the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Revenue. Yeah. And when I started my career at Dakota County, he made a joke one time and he said, you know, property taxes in Minnesota are arguably the most complicated in the nation. If you can do property taxes here, you can do them anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. there you go. You're proof. so we are, to Councilmember Keeley's point, we're a little disadvantaged by the fact that all the additional kind of education that we have to bring to bear to help people understand exactly what is happening with their property tax monies. So this is the general fund as revised, as we've talked about at some length, uh, that 45% Projected fund balance, right now we're keeping it stable at that 45% uh, to stay within city council policy. And as also talked about in a previous slide, this assumes that the city will claim all of the ARPA funds as revenue loss and allocate them to the general fund in an expansion of the strategy that was adopted by the council as a part of the 2022 budget and the financial plan through the year 2026. So right now, the recommendations for the property tax levy, again, to meet with the strategic priorities of the council and to support the organizational needs that have been described by the department directors, both at previous meetings, most notably at the all-day work session, the recommendation of the financial management plan, uh, end of staff is to support the request for 12.5 FTEs. As a reminder, it's 15.5 in total if we include those utility funds. Of course, the caveat that has to be issued here, pending the organizational analysis that is ongoing, and we'll get some more information from CLA uh, in the near future. And then, as I mentioned, authorize the recognition of the ARPA funds as revenue loss and assign the unallocated to government services. The one thing I would like to stress here, one of the virtues of recognizing it as revenue loss, it actually streamlines all of the reporting requirements for the city. Uh, ARPA and the new guidance from the Treasury Department basically allows the city to claim a one-time $10 million allowance for revenue loss, and once that happens, the city only has to make report on it 
really once as a part of one of the annual project and expenditure reports. One of the reasons that staff is very interested in council feedback on this particular topic is that first project and expenditure report is due to the federal government on April 30th. So we're, we're eager for guidance so we can complete those reporting uh, obligations appropriately. Uh, and if we wanted to claim it all as lost revenue, that would essentially, at least for the time being, of course guidance can change, there can be special requests, would end kind of the formal reporting requirement to the federal government. Uh, and then right now to increase the property tax levy by that 10% for taxes payable in 2023. Uh, the one thing I'd also mention too that we discussed at the financial management plan, right now the formal recommendation is for the 10%. We have all of those pending studies and we have some time to look at 24 and 25 to perhaps fiddle with these numbers a little more and adjust them accordingly. For example, if the organizational analysis were to bear out that perhaps some of the FTEs could be pushed out, that may change some of these numbers. And it may come down if we get new information, much like our discussion related to the facilities study, where we'll get a better number, the organizational analysis will give us a better number, and of course we'll be in a position to fold that in uh, to the discussion with the City Council. So when we're looking at that 10% that you're recommending, this is just your starting point as we continue this budget process. Madam Mayor, members along. of the council, technically this is step two. The first uh, kind of starting point was that 10.9, and based on the feedback that we received from the council, particularly the question as it related to additional debt service to reduce the levy, this is now uh, the, the next iteration of this property tax amount based on council feedback and questions. So it could certainly be adjusted based on the additional information that we get from that previous slide with all the circles and arrows that describe all of the different things that have still kind of yet to come to fruition as a part of the planning process. And that's what I'm getting at. You still have each, depart each department to get at their budgets and then coming back and then this 10% might look different like you, we've always done in the past. Yeah, Madam Mayor, certainly possible. One of the things and consistent with the recommendation and the kind of ask that was included in the memorandum to the council that we'd be interested in having guidance from the council about this 10%. When we talk about the budget calendar in a second here, really the next step is for the interim city manager to give formal direction to the department to basically say, this is what we've heard as far as strategic direction is concerned from the council. This is the amount that they've expressed comfort with and that's to give them the opportunity then to thoughtfully over the next couple months before we come back to the council to put together uh, their budget. Of course, it doesn't obligate the council to anything, but our goal in all things is try to avoid any significant amount of rework to make sure that we're, we're kind of proceeding consistent with your general expectations regarding the, the property tax levy with the, the number of caveats as enumerated. Okay. All right. So before we go to your follow-up question number four. Can, can I have yeah, the I'll, last screen I had again? Uh, go so back. Can, yeah. Sorry. I'm going to. I'm gonna start doing a magnifying glass. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay, so before we go on to question number four, we're gonna take a, a 10 minute break. Okay. Oh, thank okay. God. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Kara, did you want me to send you the PowerPoint? Yes.
ready? Do you want me to get you? Okay. We're back on the air. So we'll have to go. It's yes. back to you. <coughs> Thank you. Awesome. Mayor, will One more. Group. No more. Group. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. So the fourth follow-up question, assuming there are no additional questions about property taxes at this time, could the city use additional debt to reduce the increase in the property tax levy. So one thing that we have talked about in the past when we've discussed debt, debt is a tool that can be used, of course, to finance things that ultimately the city cannot pay in cash. It can be used to spread out the cost of a project to among the different folks that are using it. But as this question poses, it can also be used to smooth out changes in the property tax rate to make sure that people have stable, predictable rates over time. That you don't have to increase the levy significantly because now you're going to spend some millions of dollars. You can borrow the money and spread it out. So as you remember from the financial management plan work session, as you see here, in uh, 2023, the city was proposing to borrow about $28.6 million. And through the rest of the planning window, the borrowing needs of the city are actually relatively modest. You may recall that once some of the debt expires, your debt service actually ends up being about half of what it is right now. Meaning generally that the city has a very strong debt profile and is in a, is a, is in a reasonably strong position to actually borrow money and protect its property tax rate over time and to finance projects that it needs. And we've talked about that a little bit when we were going through the franchise uh, fee discussion with the facilities capital project fund. Some of those levies now have to be paid for by debt service because there's not additional revenue. So you have that option available, put simply you have capacity to consider additional debt. The one thing that we've talked about uh, at the previous meeting is right now because of the rate environment and the anticipated increase in the federal funds rate, you may recall if you were monitoring the changes in the federal funds rate kind of late last year, they were talking about one to two rate increases in the following year. And then earlier this year, it was kind of three to four. Now, depending on who you're listening to, it can really be five to seven. And in fact, Goldman Sachs recently increased their expectation to seven rate increases. And some of those rate increases may be higher than the typical 25 basis points, 50 basis points in some situations. So there may be some consideration with some of this borrowing, perhaps to do it earlier in the year to take advantage of a lower rate uh, situation and save the city some interest expense over time. Uh, additionally, you do have some projects from the previous year the city has yet to bond for, and we're going to be exploring. We've already started having conversations with the city manager about also issuing debt that would ordinarily have been issued at the end of last year, and we've kind of held off on. But given the rate environment, the city is well advised to move on some of those projects. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is right now, and that will be likely an item that the council will be considering at your second meeting in April. The current CIP uh, has about $880,000 budgeted for a rescue pumper. We do know from supply chain disruptions, price of steel, what have you, demand for these vehicles has increased and the costs have increased. And working with the <coughs> vendor that the city plans to procure the vehicle from, we know that that cost actually may be closer to $1.1 million. And if the city does not place an order by the end of May or by the end of September, those rates are, those costs are expected to go up by uh, 7% uh, at each of those points in time. So one thing that the city will consider doing is, and it's factored into this plan, is actually issuing an equipment certificate to support the cost of that vehicle. One thing that would have to happen at the end of April in order to avoid that 7% increase is the council would be asked to place the order for the vehicle at the lower price and then much like you've seen when we do uh, the bonding requests at the beginning of the year, there would be a reimbursement resolution, basically preserving the right of the city to borrow money at a later date in order to reimburse itself for the capital outlay. It's worth noting that that action does not obligate the city to issue any debt or bond. It just basically preserves your right to do so. Um, so it's not something that I think the city would normally do. We, that's usually an annual housekeeping item, but given the challenges that have been outlined in the financial management plan and really the ability to avoid what would be cost increase of tens of thousands of dollars on a vehicle, uh, you'll see some more information in the near future about that. So I figure since we're already talking about it by way of introduction, um, of course, uh, the fire department and the finance department will provide more information as that meeting gets a little closer. But as we've talked before, under the guise of no surprises, you may see that one coming uh, 
around the corner here in a few minutes in a few weeks I will say to Dan's point we will absolutely provide the council with addi additional information and it would be my recommendation that we do proceed with what Dan is is uh, talked about there the the money is available it's planned um, and frankly the increases in equipment costs are um, significant and if I can just add yeah. that we're also looking Chief. at 23 month delivery time so not only has the cost go up, gone up but the procurement time has over doubled on both ambulances and fire trucks so um, you see it in civilian vehicles but we're also seeing it in emergency response vehicles which is leaving us with um, some pretty high use vehicles for a longer period of time so supply chain issues B BJ put it nicely yeah um, in that uh, we really do need to consider doing this now, particularly with a 23 month lead time. Uh, we use equipment for a long period of time in this organization. We're very efficient about uh, about our capital equipment, um, particularly fire engines. Um, and this this could potentially pose operational challenges should we should we not do it. So uh, again, it would be my recommendation to, to follow what Dan just described. Okay. So as revised, this is the bonding recommendation uh, as Councilman Keeley and I were discussing it during the break as a part of the process we went back and looked through the CIP and essentially found additional projects that would be good candidates for bonding. And as a result, as you can see kind of comparing the two, we've added some additional <coughs> bonding about still 28.9 million. But what's not included on this slide is in 2022, there will be some additional bonding that's being recommended as well, particularly $3 million in the infrastructure trust fund. The fund has ample reserves and is well managed. As you may recall from the financial management plan, it was basically steady as she goes. But the ordinance as adopted by a previous council does allow for bonding to support the fund and the city could bond in that fund, <coughs> reduce the property tax levy over a few years and then bring it back up accordingly and what that will do is help blunt those property tax increases in those first three years as you've seen on the previous slide eventually that levy in the infrastructure trust will have to go back to a same or similar level but it can be reduced with those influx of bond proceeds uh, so as you can see also uh, there's reduced 3.7 million due to the anticipated host fee revenue so as we talked about in the previous slide there were three bond issues that were planned for that fund now it's down to two uh, and they've gone down a little bit. They reached three million. So now we're able to reduce the amount there and pay for them with host fees. But then over the, that 11 years, there's new debt of additional 6.7 million. So overall, it's increased by about three million. So then the breakdown here over those 11 years, you can see in the vehicle and equipment fund, this is additional bonding. So we were already planning as per, per the financial management plan on issuing an equipment certificate for that uh, rescue pumper but with the additional cost pressure, we've added $300,000 to pay for it. This number, this may change to 2022. It all kind of depends on the conversation that we just had about perhaps moving some bonding forward. Uh, we'll also have to discuss the bond sizing and what, what makes sense to issue in 2022. So more to come on that, of course, in the future. And as you know, any bonds that would ultimately be issued, there are a few council actions that have to happen in the interim so you would be well aware if the city were to move in that direction what the timing would be 1.6 million 25 and then 600,000 in 2026 we have some additional monies planned for the parks fund in 2024 and then as i mentioned in 2022 we have the three million dollars for the infrastructure trust fund in total by 2026 you'd have about 198 thousand uh, dollars in additional debt service payments and over the life of the bonds, you would pay about $2.5 million in additional interest. So like we talked about on the previous slides, that would be the trade-off in essentially reducing the property tax levy increase over time, but then you would increase the amount of interest expense that the city would pay. But again, you could be sensitive to those tax rates and not have as large of increases year over year. So just keep that in mind, right around two point. Five million is what the additional cost would be but as we discussed on this previous slide there is plenty of capacity here and as some of that debt rolls off and gets phased in you can still absorb it and have those uh, lower property tax rate increases that we discussed on previous slides so ultimately these are the recommendations uh, before I move to the next slide I'd pause for any questions that the council may have about these debt scenarios 
as I did share with Council Member Keeley, uh, we have looked very hard at the CIP. There may be a handful of additional projects that could be added, but we would be kind of maneuvering around the margins at that point. I don't think it would have a meaningful impact on the amount of debt or uh, the property tax levy itself. Excuse me. Okay. Yes. So just a summary of the recommendations for the EDA fund. We're recommending to increase the uh, statutory maximum project tax payable, uh, this should say in 2026, that's a, a typo there. Uh, authorize the use of those TIF funds, that million dollars that we talked about, to jumpstart those housing uh, redevelopment and assistance programs. In the facilities capital project fund, assigning those $420,000 of host fees that were not previously recognized as a part of the uh, previous iteration of the financial management plan. Issue those $3 million in bonds in 2022 and uh, 2031, again, to reduce that revenue pressure on the fund. As I mentioned, with no increase in franchise fees and no modifications to the complement of projects, these amounts will have to be transitioned to the debt levy. So they will not be supported by franchise fees. And then as far as property tax go, we've talked about this already, but supporting that request for the 12.5 FTEs, again, pending the organizational assessment, as we've talked at the previous financial management plan discussion, we're really for the purposes of the FTE at the concept planning level, creating, creating and understanding costs, and then we'll get the design and engineering from the organizational analysis and the council will receive additional information through that process about what is recommended by uh, CLA. We're also recommending authorizing the recognition of all those ARPA funds. First is lost revenue to streamline the reporting process and to relieve the city of th those additional obligations and then assigning that unallocated two million uh, that Greg described quite well uh, for, to support government services. And that those numbers are then baked into this increase in the property tax levy by uh, 10% in 2023. And then as we just talked about, issue those additional 6.7 million in debt over the next 11 years, again, to reduce pressure on both the franchise uh, fees and then also the property tax uh, levy, particularly the rate over time. And we would have a schedule of that 6.7 in the next 11 years. Yep. Of what? This is the schedule, the schedule here. And so, yeah, it was really hard to see. This yes. So one of the challenges with the 10-year financial management yeah. plan is trying to fit all 10 years on a slide. But, it, but you know, if it's 11 million that were, yeah, the 11, in the, the 11 years, it's just, there oh, you it, go. Oh, we could have been yeah. zoomed in the whole time. What? Wow. Is that first year 2023 projected? All right, start over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, I'll see you guys next month. <laughs> Wow. Don't start over. Yeah. It's good humor. So. Tom Venables, did you know about that particular feature? This? <laughs> yes. Well, oh, he was looking for the bigger screen. <laughs> well, well, Dan did something that. <laughs> it wasn't me. No, it's it's a it's Jay in the control. Oh, Jay in the control. Oh, Jay. Oh, Jay. oh now with the blinky lights coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Best laid plans. So the last item, uh, that just to kind of close, the council had discussed the and it talked about what is the detailed budget calendar moving forward and you may have recall this slide from the one-time funding uh, discussion where we also paired the budget calendar so really right now we are in the planning phase this April 5th kind of outlooks and objectives meeting is designed to provide the council with an opportunity to get the update to the financial management plan the questions and information about the questions that were posed at the previous meeting and then also give some formal guidance to staff about how to move into the next phase which is then to review the budget. There'll be a check-in with the council about the financial position of the city as a part of the review of the financial statements or essentially the city's audit. That'll happen in June. And then really we're back before you on the 28th to talk about the capital improvement plan. And we'll have some discussions there. And um, around that time as well, there'll be some additional information as Garrett shared related to the facility study that will hopefully be brought to bear in that discussion. Nothing final because we still have to wait till August for that, but there'll be a check-in. And uh, then using the guidance that is provided from this meeting and the, what we call the city manager's instructions that get sent to the departments, one thing that we're doing new this year to increase the transparency in the budget and to include the department directors more in the budget development process is we've scheduled a week of what we're calling department meetings with the city manager. So what will end up happening is departments will be asked to formally make their requests. 
We will, we will compile those requests, and then they will meet with Greg and myself and um, some other folks from finance to an HR, if they have HR requests, particularly staff, to go over them, to talk about them, so then the city manager can make informed decisions about what ultimately <coughs> becomes what we'll call the proposed 2023 budget, which is the recommendation from the city manager. So having heard from the council and his strategic direction and the various plans and priorities, the guidance through these, this budget process, and then ultimately the formal input from the directors, we would come back then in August and talk about what we have compiled for the budget. And by that point in time, we should have a lot better information, particularly as it relates to organizational analysis, facilities, and fleet uh, in particular. And then we do have some time set aside in December to talk again about the proposed budget uh, if needed. And I phrase this as if needed because as you'll recall during the one-time funding discussion, we have moved everything forward by about six weeks to two months depending on the deadline. Mm -hmm. And we are aiming at this point to kind of have everything <coughs> finalized by September 20th. So as you see in the decided, that the council would then approve your max tax. And then after the fact, we do have a couple meetings set aside if there's additional discussion that may be needed, if there are significant changes between max tax and final tax. But really what we'd be hoping to do by that point in time is have the budget essentially done. And then at the December meeting, what I would imagine would come before you, assuming there aren't significant changes, is a document that we would really call December changes. So we would give you a list of all of the budget changes over a certain dollar amount, things that are material for a council consideration, not you know moving $500 here and $500 there, but you know things like over, let's say, $20,000, we've made some adjustments. So then you can see between the 20th and the 6th what has changed. But ultimately, at that point in time, if we've done our job well, there will not be kind of significant changes outside of you know, factors that the city cannot control, of course. And then at the 6th is when you would conduct your truth and taxation hearing and then adopt the respective property tax levies. So right now, that is the, the plan, review, decide model. And as you can see, we're kind of at the end of the planning phase. And so as discussed in the uh, memo to the council, we are very interested in some formal guidance. So Greg can basically craft some formal instructions to the department directors. And then we go away for a couple months. And as the mayor uh, mentioned, sharpen our pencils, get additional information, and then provide you with uh, what will look more like a typical budget presentation. It wouldn't necessarily be on like Eller's PowerPoint stock and stuff like that. It would look more like you've seen in the past. Uh, but just I, I tell you that just by way of what you can kind of imagine in the process. Um, so that's the plan right now. And then, of course, assuming that this works for everyone, this is the first year that we've attempted this. And so one thing that I would imagine, or at least I would anticipate, uh, a future finance director would do at next year's all day work session uh, is have a conversation with you about did this work so we would have a debrief to say we upended the budget process a little bit last year did it work for you was it helpful we're all the, having the parties involved and that way much like we talk about the budget itself we will make sure that the budget development process is also iterative and responsible to uh, and responsive as Greg would say to the council's needs and of course the, the department directors to make sure that they, of course, have adequate time to give you the information that you need to make good public policy. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, the council may have. Well, let me ask the council. Council, what are your thoughts about the process that uh, we've been going through in this planning session and then to the review and the decision phase? and the information that we have received from, from staff. Dan, like, Dan did, Kay? Oh, did you want, did you, oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna fill in the gaps. Oh, go, go. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember what I was gonna say. We'll make up something. Um, I like getting bad news early so that we can, and none of this was bad news, so let me start on a different foot. I like getting um, information that might be potentially uncomfortable to discuss early um, so that we can work through it with Greg and um, talk about it, get through it. Um, you know, none of this stuff is uh, impossible. And so I really liked this and getting started, it seems like a little bit sooner than we normally would. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, two and thumbs up. Any, okay. Any, any questions with what has been recommended by staff? Um, not right now, but as we go and yeah. kind of digest these things a little bit more along the way, I'm sure questions will pop up. But right now, I feel like we're just kind of coming in for landing and we'll... So keep on. Mm -hmm. Staff, do st stay the course? I like it. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Um, <clears throat> it's not news we want to hear, but it's news we all expected to hear especially in the last few months talking about all the, the challenges we have. You know, as a council, you never, nobody's really happy about having to raise taxes and you're always looking for ways to keep it down. But you also, we have a responsibility as a council to do policies, to create policies that help the staff manage the city that creates an environment for us to have the proper amount of employees to get the services done for our citizens. Um, those are all very important. But we also, it's also important that we find ways to create opportunities for businesses and developments to come to our city. I mean, as a, as a city that's in redevelopment, we're gonna have to pay a price on that. And that was eye-opening when you showed me some of the balances a lot of those cities had in their EDAs and that it was like my god especially Finley. We, we, yeah we I mean <laughs> we, we begged the county to maybe give us a grant so we may be able to help some way but it's not significant was that enough the city did? Mayor it comes, yes it was yeah <laughs> so yeah it's 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 not comfortable but I'm comfortable with the direction we're going and uh, I, I feel confident that everyone here has worked very hard to put a plan together that's going to work for our city long term and we and we have to just grab reality right now and face it and just take care of business. And okay. So I'm okay with continuing the path we're on. Okay, Kara? Uh, the, the process is fine. I realize that there are some informational challenges, um, which is no one's, you know, no one's fault and that is being worked on. Um, so that will be good. Uh, just as we're doing a facility study, everything like that. Um, one thing we haven't done in depth is looking at what are all of our services? Are those the services that are still the ones that we want to offer? Do they need to be modified? So we do have to go forward predicated on assumptions, but that is a big area of assumptions that we have not examined in depth and, and looking at what are the services that our community needs or desires and how will that change and how can we plan for that in the future. Um, I am hopeful that that will become something that we do um, so that that can inform our priorities and our budgeting process. Mm -hmm. Dan T. You have to uh, stop writing notes on your speech. <laughs> My questions. <laughs> um, what is the levy impact after, uh, uh, to the, the next three or four years by adding that 6.7 in debt? I didn't see a slide that had revised numbers. So this uh, slide here reflects the debt. Oh, so the 10.9 so went to 10.0 because of the additional debt service. Correct. Correct. And, and some other Adjusted. changes around the margins. Um, what percentage points of that 10.0 does the EDA levy at the max rate that you're recommending represent? Hold on. In just a second here. I'm going to wake my computer up. I know it was in your presentation that you were suggesting it, but it never got delineated as to what right. points value it was. Put it that way. I think it's yeah, Ma'am, Ma'am, we didn't we discuss it as the. It'd be around 3%, though. I mean, a million dollars is 3%. It's a million dollars. It's a little more than a million. Yeah, that's why I was saying it's about 2%. 1.4 1. 1. is the statutory limit right now. And you were recommending that we go to the max? To the max. By 2026. By 2026, yes. Which, uh, in, for points of clarity, would actually be more like 1.5 because as yes. additional value comes online. Right. So the staff recommendation for 2020, pay 2023 would be 1 million. 1 million. Yeah. Yeah. For the right. And currently we've been 
annually adding right what, two like two ninety seven right now. The right council has been adding about a hundred thousand. The plan is at a hundred thousand to twenty four, and then go down to fifty after that. Right. Yeah. So we'd be adding about seven hundred to what we were doing, which is about two point one point three mm -hmm. points, yeah. one and three quarter points roughly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of the so of the ten point zero, a little less than two points represented by the EDA bump. That's a good ballpark. Pretty close. Yeah, that's a good ballpark. Hmm. Uh, I don't think now is the time that we fund that 100%. Yeah. Um, you know, when we went through the the Great Recession, we, we did some pretty extraordinary things. Uh, the city mm -hmm. passed a zero levy and 20 FTEs, um, 19, I believe, as I was told, through uh, a city manager at the time were uh, through attrition, so there's only one. I asked him, was there any pink slips given per se? And sorry to use that term if that's offending to anybody, but just did we actually have to cut somebody? And I think he said one person, but so because it was over like a year and a half, almost two year period, it was a very prolonged process. Um, but um, we also took on more debt for the ITF back then um, to, to uh, reduce the levy. There, so there's tools in our toolbox. To blunt this um, this number, and um, one of them is, in my opinion, uh, is not to get aggressive uh, on the EDA uh, at a time like this. When we get back to levies that reflect more normal levels of cost increases, and maybe that in today's world is more like the the four to five range, and not the ten range, I think. That's when I would be open to have a discussion about uh, funding the EDA. I certainly am in favor of it. I've been a proponent of it in recent budget discussions going back a few years, but um, I, I certainly wouldn't be jumping to the max right now. Um, our primary business is public safety because that's 80% of our budget, and so <coughs> I'm anxious to see the eventual results of the staffing study that Madam Mayor asked for two years ago would have been nice to have a year ago as we kind of went into this mess uh, or even into the pandemic and had a better handle on what our real needs are justified by all the departments that are represented um, because I feel like we got a, a really bad surprise uh, in addition to another bad surprise which was the cliff mm -hmm. um, and uh, council member uh, Gustafson you apparently got a different answer than I got because I was told there wouldn't be at a cliff and at the time that we were making that vote in December, you corrected the record and, and it put me in a very bad position that I hope I never find myself in again. Um, so um, I think from a takeaway standpoint, the only time sensitive question based on the amount of information that we've gotten so far, I believe there's only one in your presentation that you're really looking for an answer for tonight because it's on a time limit. The ARPA. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, of course, interested in guidance on all of the recommendations. I would say the two that are most pressing would be the ARPA consideration because of the April 30th deadline, and then additionally the property tax levy change to begin the budget discussion process sure. at the staff level. So you're looking for a number. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I am. If you have a number, I'm of course interested to hear it. <laughs> uh, well, it's difficult because I don't know that we have enough. My other question is, do we know when we're going to get an answer on a safer grant? Because that has a world of an impact on what we're talking about. Because I can only assume that the 13 and a half, I believe it was 12 and a half, um, is made up largely of public safety, and in both cases, oh, yeah. fire and police are going after grants. And so we, we, we seem to be going into this assuming we're going to get nothing, but what if we do get something? That has a huge impact on this levy discussion. And I feel like we're going to spend months telling a very difficult story, and then we could get a great surprise uh, in the form of a grant that causes the levy to drop pretty dramatically. Yeah, uh, hopefully before it's September, if that's well, what, what if we don't. For. And yeah, and what if we don't? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, that's an unanswered question. If we're going to, you know, we've talked about adding staff. You've presented many times, BJ, that you need the staff. I support the staff. 
but we also have the ability to get grants to take care of the first three years, which that's three years of what we've just been talking about of really ugly levies. So uh, it'd be nice to have an idea of when we'll have an answer because we've <laughs> got to go through this budget process regardless. But if there's a grant laying out there that we could potentially get, it factors into the discussion from my perspective. Yeah, BJ. Madam Mayor, members of the council, I don't have a specific timeline. I heard that late second quarter, May, late May, we might start seeing rounds, but they do it generally in rounds, so you get so many a week, and they can have multiple rounds. So it, you don't really know when that could be, and I would just note that the safer grant only takes care of a piece of that, right? So that's some of the staffing. There wasn't an ability to get all the staffing through that. So it's a stair-stepped approach, right? That's one need as well as many other needs that are out there. So um, yes, the safer grant would be great, but I just, I don't want us to believe that that's the only solution for, um, sure, because it has some pretty stringent guidance on what it can be used for. Right. So. What would the be? It only covers a couple of years. Uh, three years, as yeah. I'm told, but, but, but then we have to find the salary in three years. I mean, it's just, it's yeah. kicking it down the road again. Well, and, and, yes, but there's, and there's we can't keep doing that. That's why we're having these discussions now. I guess could we just ask the question: What if you got the safer grant? What do you expect it to be in dollars? <laughs> Madam Mayor, <laughs> Council, um, I just pulled up my update to you uh, when I had authorized BJ to make application for the grant. Uh, it's eight hundred and twenty-one thousand three hundred and four dollars yeah. yeah. for six positions, um, and that is over a three-year period of time. It does obligate the organization to fully fund those positions. Yeah. Is it 800 per year, or that's the total of the three years? The annual base salary. Yeah. And benefits. Per year. And benefits. Per, per year. year. So 821000 800. That's a two-point uh, levy impact, basically. At 400000 a point, it's about two points. So, Dan, can you? Yeah, Madam Mayor, members of the council, you know, last year 1.8 was four point. 8%, so, you know, basically 2% is a good round number for about $800,000. Uh, the thing to keep in mind, and Councilmember Gustafson always already, already referenced it, is in a scenario where the city were to win a safer grant, what would ultimately happen is we would still be adjusting up the levy over that three-year period to basically fill in that $900,000 approximately as not to get in a situation like we talked about with the fund balance conversation where suddenly we just have to increase the better part of a million dollars in one year because we are obligated for a certain term after the grant expires to fully fund those positions. So while there certainly would be a reduction in the levy have, for having to not have to pay for all those FTEs in that those first three years, right. we would still advise the council to increase the levy by some incremental amount. So when they roll off the grant, you have the funds available to pay for them. So it would save some money, right. but not the not full freight. And I agree 100% on stair stepping it up. Mm -hmm. it, ultimately, if it was a two point drop, but we said, well, in three years we got to get to that two points, then we're gonna then we're gonna, you know, maybe put in, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 mm -hmm. you know, whatever it might be, or 0 0.7, right, over three years. So when we absorb that that year that it hits our payroll, we're already ready for it, right? We've already levied up for it. Mm -hmm. So maybe the net is a little over a point savings yeah. in in this first year. And Madam Mayor, members of the council, as uh, Councilmember Keeley mentioned as well, there's of course also a COPS grant. The city has applied for that in the past and was not yeah. successful in the last COPS round. did not get that grant. So there could be another grant that could happen. And again, we would imagine a similar, similar scenario. scenario right? If memory serves, the amount of police officers in the last round were greater. I think it was five or six that were also asked for as a part of that process. Right now, the FTE complement that's assumed for the financial management plan is three police officers and three firefighters. Uh, and then in the following year, there is, an, there is another three for that six. So it's possible that it could get wiped out, uh, but we again would have to make those adjustments. You applied for six, but in the budget you're, plan you're asking for proposing for three, mm -hmm. right? I, I would be cautious about making any um, statements about where those 12.5 are, are gotcha. delegated to at this point, Council Member Keeley. Yes. Um, I need to make some decisions with our department heads gotcha. on, on how we do that, and I really need the results of the staffing analysis to do that. As, yeah, we all, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so I, that, that's why I've, I've, I very much 
hesitated in going beyond what that 15.5 FTEs might be. I think it's a, gotcha. I think it's an adequate placeholder, um, and I'm going to want to work with the team to identify what the priorities are and what we ultimately would put back in front of you for a, the final budget. Okay. Fair enough. But it answers my question. Thank you. Yes. Madam. Okay. Um, again, you uh, had I, I, uh, Councilmember Key, I respectfully disagree with you about the EDA. I don't think now is the time to draw back on trying to put together a program that helps grow our city. We've been sitting there kind of cruising for a while with no money in our EDA. We can't quite honestly work with any large development because we have nothing really to offer them to come into our city. Our, in fact, we don't even have an EDA staff that could actually work with some large developers in some of the big projects. We, we have to at some point do this and you can't kick it off four or five years down the road that we'll start building it up then because these developers are going to build all around us. There's plenty of, plenty of green space around us to build. And they're going to go into these cities and they're going to build and we're going to sit here wondering why we're not getting this. Our infills are pretty much full. And so now it's going to come time to either remodeling or taking down buildings and, and putting up new projects. And the city needs to be a partner with these developers in making this happen. I'm going to go to our staff because this is all of us together. We've all been listening to the budget presentations together. And um, what do you all think about the process that we're going through now? <coughs> Where, what, are you, what are your thoughts? And because there's a new part that uh, is added to this where you're going to look at your budgets and look at what your needs are. You're going to sit down uh, with the city manager and identify all of that and then we would have that information as we look at the totality of the levy that we have to uh, put in place so that you can have um, the resources you need to meet the expectations of our community because we're a service organization and um, and our services are in your departments so Jenny what do you think about the process and how we're going through and that we're all hearing the same information at the same time um, well generally speaking it's a great process we've never done this before as a staff and so it is um, it's never been as transparent, I will say. So certainly supportive of that. And then we're able to tell you what the needs are in a way we never have been able to before. So certainly support the process. Great, because that's the idea that we talked about at the, at the all day work session. It's all of us together doing this. And um, Kara was saying that, you know, what are the services? Well, you know, I know what your services are but I've been around for 28 years. Then you tag in my two years in the council, I'm 30 years. What? I'm not saying I don't know what oh the God. services are. I'm saying we need to evaluate what the service. services are of value and look at them for the future. So this is not ignorance. Okay, so the thing, so I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I didn't mean um, that you were ignorant of the services, but I think that'll help when you're all putting everything together, you will have um, an understanding of what are the significant services that you need to provide for the citizens. So, and you have anything else to add to that, Jenny, or? No, no, I'm, I'm good. Chief, BJ. No, I think this is a good process. It's new for all of us, so we're all in it together, and I, I think it's a good way to go through it. I think we're pending a lot of information to to come forth in the next couple of months. I think it's a, you know, a big undertaking, but it'll be good because we'll have all the information in front of us as we move forward. So. Okay. Carissa? I agree. I think it's a good process. This aligns a little bit more with what I'm used to from other organizations. So this is something familiar to me, something that, that seems to make sense, and I think it's a great process moving forward, and I like that we're doing it. I do agree with BJ. I know we're pending a lot of information right now to get to the budget, but I think it's good to start at least talking about it, having it out there, having it known. I think it's just going to help us and help hopefully better prepare you as a council to anticipate what you're going to be hearing from us in terms of numbers and additional budget contributions. So, yeah. yeah. Being in HR, everything is about the people. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and it's going to come under your umbrella. Yep. 
I, I would agree. I, I, it's nice to be part of a larger process. Um, to I, for all of us in the room to be on the same page, but I think particularly for staff to be on the same page as we go, you know, kind of back and, and thinking about our work and the broader work and be able to look at this as a team rather than, I think, kind of perhaps a, an older mindset of just looking at it by department, right? We can actually see the bigger picture and figure out where we can help each other out too. Great. Yeah, yes. <clears throat> Ben and Mayor, members of the council. Yep, I'm super excited to be part of the discussion. I really appreciate um, all of this. I'm learning so much. I am glad to be here. Um, one thing I think it might be helpful just to contribute, uh, this has come up quite a bit tonight. Um, the organizational analysis is going along really well. Um, the group has been doing, you know, uncovering a lot of data. The, the leadership team has been providing them um, a lot of information, stuff, stuff that you've directed um, us to provide to them. Um, they've, they've spoken with staff. They're working on um, their reports now and are planning to present um, at the May 10th work session. Just to give you an idea of timeline, so um, Greg and the leadership team will have uh, a chance to um, help to make sure that that reflects um, everything that we need it to for, for your um, information. But just to give you an idea, I think that's helpful um, for you to know too as we're thinking about how this, this contributes to the, the overall conversation. Thanks, so. Bethany. Yep. Tom. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members, I echo uh, what's been previously said, but I also would add um, the earlier process this year is, is, is going to be helpful. It, it allows us to get ahead of a lot of information gathering and conversations with other um, department heads, to make sure that we're um, adequately um, identifying the needs and then also uh, the other be added benefit is there's several strategic plans going forward at this time too that we can align with. So definitely been a great process up to this point. More to come obviously, but uh, so far it's been very good. Good. Garrett. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, I find this process extremely refreshing. Um, I've been with the city for 24 years now and um, for those who have been around for quite a while, we have terminology called the Burnsville Way, um, which is we've made do and just tried to get by with things uh, to the best of our ability and didn't have these opportunities to kind of have these open dialogues. Um, for those who had a chance to tour the police station uh, prior to the remodel, I remember comments from council going, how did you guys let this get to this point? Why didn't we know about it, right? And those avenues to have these discussions were not available. So now we've kind of flipped the switch where we have study after study and things going on, and we have 20 years of things that are, are being exposed right now. And I, I know it's a lot, and it's, I can understand you know, the, the challenges that we face and the, and the numbers that are up there. And, I think all of us are aware, very well aware of that and have the same anxieties and things like that too. But um, the best part is that we're here at the table and part of the discussion and uh, able to at least share what's going on in the organization. So thank you. I'm glad because it is, we said it's all of us together. And I remember those tours of the police department before we did anything. And I said, and Jenny, have you not seen the code violations in police? Oh my God, we wouldn't let that go. And I remember saying to Heather, are you kidding me? When in a garage, we were doing crime scene analysis and had heaters plugged into things, I was embarrassed. And yes, we may do with a lot of things, and it was not good. Right, Jenny? Because you were in the dark also. You didn't see all the code violations. Well, Madam Mayor, this process, like Garrett and others have said, it's much more transparent, um, which is very beneficial. And so it is refreshing. It was a word that I had kind of thought of, too. And it, and it is, and it's, it is very different from what we've done in the past. So I'm also happy to hear Carissa say 
this is what she's experienced in other organizations, right? Yeah. This is normal to her. Um, so, and it's very different to some of us who have been around for a long time yeah. and haven't been aware of a lot of the other things happening in the other departments. So. Yeah. So I'm glad that we're going through this together, this budget journey together, because we're all hearing the same thing, we're all seeing the same thing, and then we're all making the decisions together about this organization going forward. Because, yeah, we have done a lot and made do with things. <laughs> Our staff, I give great, um, um, credit to the people who work here in Burnsville because you did make it work. You all did make it work and we looked good and you made us look good. But you struggled and that's why what I experienced lately is a lot of you have employees that are stressed out, have not taken vacations, have not, to, when they're sick they come to work and uh, and that's not good. So we have to do right by all of you because you're the ones who deliver the service uh, and meet the, the needs of our, of our people. And uh, Greg, to you and Dan and staff, thank you because this is different from what I had experienced in the past. And what this has done is bringing all of us together, hearing the same thing, and I mean, just listening to all of you. We've not sat and hear the same thing. You hear something different, we hear something different, and then you come and you hear the, the decisions that we make uh, about the budget. And then I sort of hear, well, does the council really understand what we're doing? Not if we don't know. So it's good to have you here. It's good to have you tell us. And so there are some things that, um, that have been asked about tonight. Uh, and uh, I understand, Dan, that you want us to give you direction on the three pieces. And I think from my perspective, now I don't know about others, but as we're moving forward and what we need, um, to do is to, that the ARPA funds all need to go with, with the losses, with our revenue loss. We need to get to do this better. And then the 10% that you're operating from now, when you guys sharpen your pencils and all of the department heads are going to look at their budgets and everything else, you know, this group of people who work for us have sharpened their pencils and it always comes down. So I don't know <coughs> how much, but I trust in you. I trust in your integrity and I trust that you care about this communi community and you have pride in, in the work that you do. So we have 6.7 uh, million in yeah. debt that we're going to be looking at for the next 11 years. Um, and that's going to be, so we'll know what that first year is, Dan, T, how much we're going to be living in debt. Uh, Madam Mayor. Be, it might, it'll probably the first ones are going to be for the uh, fire engine. Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, per the financial management plan at this point in time, it is proposed that in 2023, there would be about an additional $28.9 million of debt. To the question earlier in the conversation, much of that is a placeholder for phase number three at 26 million. Additionally, the city uh, for this financial management plan assumes an additional $3 million of bonding. But you're wrapping the facilities inside of all of that. 28, right? Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, yes, that's correct. Yeah. In total, over the next 11 years, under the financial management plan's recommendation, the city would issue an additional $58.5 million of debt uh, in total. Yeah. Half of which essentially comes from the phase three facilities, which 
to Garrett's point, the council will have more information in the near future. Uh, as I mentioned in the conversation though, uh, the debt profile of the city is as such that even with that additional debt, your debt levies will be half of what they are right now when those amounts are retired of the current debt. Okay. So what ends up happening is we, we do do some debt wrapping to make sure that as things come on, that we're being sensitive to tax rates. And that's why in the plans that you've seen, uh, the property tax rate has actually gone down. So um, Dan and uh, Greg and staff, when you guys take a look at all of this, I wanna understand the structural pressures. I wanna make sure that we move forward uh, in a way that um, we're going to be structurally sound uh, financially uh, as we continue to move. I, I like what you've shown us with regard to what we need to do in terms of levy for the next 10 years, but we also know one of the things is that we wanna flatten out. Madam Mayor, members of the council, after the initial three years, uh, yeah. The fourth year is a little higher than typical, but yeah. then it does return to kind of typical year over year, more modest yeah. changes. I saw, kind of I saw your percent. slide. So that's. I would, I would also add from the structural standpoint, the way the financial management plan was uh, constructed, we would say from Ellers that it is a structurally sound plan and from a financial perspective. Okay. As we talked at some length earlier, it um, tries to support the existing programs that exist in the city while also reaching for the additional strategic priorities and organizational needs that have been described by the council and the department directors respectively. Uh, as we just talked with debt, it's also very sensitive to how that debt comes online and being, um, and in fact, gets a little bit reduced over time in terms of a, from a debt levy perspective. Uh, and it honors all of the various fund balance requirements, both existing and recommended by Ellers. If you recall from the previous financial management presentation, we did include some ones for the capital project funds to make sure you had enough money uh, to uh, deal with unanticipated events. A classic example, perhaps being a cost overrun on a rescue pumper and having a few extra thousand dollars in the fund to make up the difference. Or natural so, disasters. Exactly. So I think from, from Eller's perspective, that's the, that's the lens that we bring to bear when we put together a financial management plan to make sure that what is being recommended is structurally sound and financially advisable from a number of perspectives. Okay. Um, Vince, on the recommendations that uh, Dan T needs, um, ARPA funds. Could I ask a process question? Pardon me? Yeah. yeah yes, please. I don't, he's thinking, so I thought I'd yeah. just jump in. <laughs> yeah. Yes, go ahead. This has been a great informational presentation and a you know, follow up to your last one. Um, and it, it, it's, it's helping bring it into focus. But I also feel like there's still so many pieces that aren't there yet that it's difficult from my chair to really pass any judgment or make any decisions. I feel like I've only been given 65% of the information, but I'm supposed to make some sort of conclusion based on uh, what I don't know to just provide direction. And it's a little tough. You know, I love the fact that we've done this earlier. I love the fact that we're doing it together. I don't think tonight's the night to say, yes, that go for that, yes on that, no on that. It just seems a little premature because there's too many other pieces of the puzzle that aren't quite here yet. And I, you know, the jump for two months, I know this is Greg's probably going, yeah, but I really need some answers, right? Yeah. Um, the, I didn't expect it, and it, it didn't miss the, the chart of uh, the calendar event, but I didn't, I didn't realize it'd be like a two month jump to the next one, which may be then getting a little too late. So I kind of feel like it's until we get the, 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 the we're staffing not get study. That information until June, so. Yeah, so maybe June is, is, is really the time where normally we, you know, I yeah. feel like in June we'd be making the decision that we <coughs> normally make in like in September, approaching that max tax. Now we're gonna back that up to June. That's a huge victory in my mind. That's that's really moving things back. Um, but I, tonight I just feel like, wait, I, I, there's still so much we don't know. I don't know that I can say, I mean, uh, support requests for 12 and a half FTs. Generally speaking, I think I do, but I don't know who they're for yet. And as you noted, you need to work on that. So 
it's hard for me to just say, a, you know, to give blanket approval or support for something. I guess shall without we just, really knowing the details. So shall we just say um, continue on with what we know, and then um, um, Dan T and Greg will bring back after they do some work. Yeah, I mean, we don't have it, all of it. Doesn't have to wait till June per se. I mean, as pieces yeah. come into focus, they can be shared with us. Because so can, didn't uh, you say we had to do something before? For the federal government, may I may remember the council. The first project and expenditure report for the ARPA reporting is yeah. due by April thirtieth. Yep. Ideally, we would like to claim it as lost revenue in yes. that first report, and relieve the city of the obligation of having to make future reports on the funds. Okay. That was going to be my question, Dan. Is I, and I agree with Dan Keeley. There's a lot of generalities here that I don't feel comfortable <clears throat> answering all of these indefinitely. But what is the what are the questions that you need answers to now? And if the ARPA funds is something we need to answer now, I'm comfortable yeah. saying I'm okay with this solution to move forward. I'm not comfortable saying yes or no to the other three yeah. items on that list at this time. Yeah. I only heard him say that the ARPA funds is because of the federal reporting. And Madam Mayor, members of the council, to be very clear, we can make report more than as we once. typically would, more than once. Okay. What we were trying to do, and as you've heard from uh, staff at the all-day work session, it's a question of workload and the additional work that's associated yeah. with doing the okay. reporting and tracking and yeah. whatnot. And, it, and, and full disclosure, frankly, we're paying Ellers to do that work because I don't have another choice. So yes. that, yeah. that is the decision you're making tonight uh, if we yeah. don't have direction. Uh, and I just want the council to be fully aware. Additionally, the, the ARPA funds and per treasury guidance can, when it says being used for government services, government services and the guidance are defined as really any, any service that that government would typically provide. So you still have quite a bit of flexibility in how those funds get applied moving forward. Uh, it just has to be anything that you would typically otherwise do. Okay, yeah. I think what I'm hearing, and my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong is that we stay the course with what you're doing right now and you've got a lot of work to do and coming back to us with more information after you and staff do the work that is necessary to continue to look at what those 12 FTEs would look like to to Dan's um, point uh, and then um, we'll also understand where the 10% tax payable would be. And that might be uh, June or August that we even get clarity on the 10%. I think I'm just understanding the issuance of 6.7 in, in additional bonds over the next 11 years. I think I'm <coughs> comfortable with the next 11 years and you spoke to that. We have room debt service room. Yeah. Well, I agree that uh, the ARPA funds should be used for lost revenue for the city. If we don't use it, we're going to end up having to find another 3% per year to replace that in the levy, which I don't want to do. Um, as far as the support for the request of the FTEs, I wouldn't pretend to know all the needs the staff has. Um, I trust as, as our leaders in our community and their, and their departments that they know what their needs are, they know what the critical needs are, and I, I would trust our city manager to be a part of that process to replace the critical ones that are needed. So I'm, I'm good with that as well. As far as the, the, tax in, the property tax increase, we kind of, kind of brought that on ourselves. We're, we started using ARPA funds to, to uh, do operational stuff, the one-time monies, and we got to make it up. And, I don't want to make it up up in one year. I mean, so the, the, the plan you have is a slowly to make it up. It still doesn't sound good at 10% because we never do 10% in this city, but right now, you know, it's, it's not so much a want, but it may be a need. Okay. So back for as far as I'm concerned, continue on. Greg and Dan, is this um, direction is stay the course with what you have? Recommended and so you'll come back. Are you okay with that? Or is there something more specific that you need? If there is madam mayor members of the council if there is consensus among the group tonight that um, 
we have what I will call our high level guardrail um, yeah. put in front of you. I am comfortable going back per the schedule uh, to our leadership team together uh, to start putting together department budgets. If there's something that we've talked about tonight that's a non-starter as a consensus of the group, I, I need to know that um, because each of these people uh, is, has have taken on a lot recently um, and I, I don't believe it would be fair to them or the organization for us to be starting to develop a budget based on some admittedly high level assumptions uh, that then we have to scrap in June and start over. Um, I, I, I don't know that we can handle that from a resource perspective. So um, uh, if there is broad level hesitancy, said another way, I don't have three votes to continue this, um, then I would want to regroup with Dan, I would want to regroup with the leadership team and come back to you with a different budget calendar at this point because I, out of respect for our organization and for our staff, um, I think it would be a, a pretty tall ask um, to go work through the specifics of department, department budgets based on some assumptions um, and then have to start that process over, if that makes sense. Is there consensus to move forward this way? No. No, if you're, if you're saying the consensus is yes to all of those, no. that is not, no, no. not it. Stay on course because they're going to bring it back. He said high level guardrails. All right, so I have very unclear language here, so I don't know what I'm agreeing or not agreeing to. So I need it stated very, very bluntly. Okay. What are you looking for? If the council's not comfortable with these recommendations, I'd like to know it so we can come back with, with different assumptions or answer questions that the council has. Thank you. Uh, I, I am... I am not comfortable because I don't have the information. For example, on the FTEs, it's not that we're like, no, we don't trust you, we don't believe you. But if someone is to say, oh, well, you're getting 12 and a half or 15 and a half more employees. What areas are these in? Well, shit, I don't know. Well, you approved it. So why don't you know? That, that does not work for me. Um, and I get that, like, there's a little, little chicken and egg yeah. <laughs> situation that, that we're sitting in rather uncomfortably. Um, the increase, the, the property tax levy by 10%, 10 well, I, I don't know because we have some, some other unanswered questions. I mean, basically we're getting asked tonight to set the max tax mm -hmm. and I'm not anywhere near there. I don't think, um, so. is that what you're saying, Dan T? Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, no, not by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, there I didn't are hear that. There are a few more meetings that are scheduled between now and any kind of determination on the proposed or maximum property tax levy to steal some of Greg's language. What we're really looking for at this point in time is that there is consensus of the council to essentially continue in this direction, yeah. understanding the broad range of caveats that have been enumerated yeah. in this meeting, mm -hmm. so that when the department directors start working on their individual budgets, that they are working in good faith and they are being consistent with the guidance that has been provided thus far, understanding that it may change because the organizational analysis bears something out, the council decides it wants to phase the facilities project in a way that is um, recommended by the facility study. Those things can change. I think the thing to stress here is the budget is very much an iterative process. Yeah. And as I think both Council Member and Council Schultz mentioned, we are earlier in the process and we are disadvantaged by the fact that we have less information. But to be very clear, we're earlier in the process because we are responding to council direction for more information earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. We have moved things forward by six weeks or two months and trying to get the meetings with the departments from October to August or September. Yeah. And really, just to be very frank about it, the workload and the lift of the budget does require a good two months yeah. to go back and have conversations and create estimates and get costs and have discussions. 
and do it in a way that this group talked about the all-day work session that is transparent and thoughtful and considerate of the needs of the organization, perhaps in a way that the council has mentioned hasn't been done in the past. Yep. So I'll, ca I'll ca characterize this in two ways. One, we need guidance to make sure that we are operating in good faith and we're making sure that there are no surprises in the future. So if we come back and we say, yeah, we're working on 10%, we got new information, it's 9.8 now. Yeah. Generally, I think then the council would say, okay, still maybe that's not good, but you know, to council member Workman's quick point, you've heard it kind of earlier in the process and we're working towards something. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is we are just going to need time to look through all of these things and make sure that these department directors have the opportunity to talk with Greg and bear out their needs and a councilman Gusman's point talk about their apply their expertise to what it is that they need so at this point no one's asking for really a formal decision we're not asking you to set the max tax we're not asking you to agree to 6.7 million additional bonding or even 12.5 FTEs mm -hmm. what we would like is really so Greg can draft a memo to the department directors that says I have met with the council the council has heard the following facts based on that those facts we are generally proceeding in this direction we know that there are caveats and those things may change and the council reserves the right to make decisions on any one of those caveats in the future but we're building a budget based on these parameters understanding that they may change we've talked before about let's say the labor agreements if the labor agreements settle at more than three percent that's in excess of what the count what the financial management plan assumes for wages yeah that may be then more than 10% because we don't have that information. But the budget's iterative and we can roll with the punches and give you the information as it comes and we're working from a common point of reference. Yep. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. And maybe at the end we have to have another candidly hard fought conversation about that number doesn't work. But we're kind of getting there as a team, we're all talking about it, we're considering what's happening and we're doing it, to the mayor's point, in a way that Ellers would consider financially sound and structurally advisable. It's not to say this is the final word, it's the kind of the second word. And we have three or more, three or four, or in this calendar, we have uh, three more if needed conversations if we need it. So we're not trying to take away from the council any of your policy making prerogative we're just trying I'm to make not, sure I'm for these for these two that. months that we have the opportunity to build something that's consistent with your expectations. And I agree. I, I'm not saying that you're encroaching on council's prerogative. What I'm what I'm pointing out is, even though you say we're, you're not asking us to set the max tax, which is technically true because we are not taking a formal vote on the max tax, you really are. Because you're asking to say, are you comfortable with 10%, give or take a little snick? That really is setting the max tax. And I am in no way even close to that. And if I were to say that I'm, that I'm close to that and I feel comfortable with that, I would be misleading. And that's the last thing that I want to do because then you guys are working on a certain premise and that premise may not be accurate. And I think that would be more detrimental than a delay. That's just my personal feeling on, on that. So, so what's the percentage that you, you, they, you want so that they can even I don't that. even know. Sorry, I, don't, I, what I'm understanding is Dan put together a presentation and said, here are our budget pressures. In order for us to get through these budget pressures, we're going to need to be somewhere around 10%. Yeah. Do we have the tolerance to get through these budget pressures that we just sat here for three and a half hours listening to or not? Mm -hmm. And we don't really have a choice. We have to. Um, what that final number ends up being has not been decided. Gessner can't go on the paper and say, council agrees to 10% levy because we haven't done that. Do we have nope. the appetite to get through the bed we've slept in made um, with this percentage point being a possibility but not necessarily the final final? Yeah. 
Yep. What if we make changes to our plan on our capital improvements? I think we talked about that. Is that a that would make possible? a big change in what we're doing in all these other areas. Same with franchise fees. I mean, there's all these other things that we could make modifications to that would change that 10%. What Dan's asking is, is do we have the tolerance. tolerance to get through what we need to get through with that 10% or something similar because those are where our budget pressures are going to end up being? Well, then just take the vote. My vote is I am not prepared at this point because I don't have the information. I'm, I'm, I realize you don't get all the information that is possibly out there to make a decision. There's always got to be information that's just kind of wiggly and out there. But I feel like I am nowhere near that. We have some, we have some pretty large pieces that we just, we don't know. We have placeholders. And I, these are important decisions, and I don't feel comfortable with that. You may feel comfortable with that, and I just, I don't. And I, I I don't want to. I don't want to mislead anyone that that I do. I'm not. Because it's with Greg's point. Ten. It's a lot of work that they have to do. But I'm comfortable, and I trust Greg and our staff that they're all listening to us right now and understand where we're at. Mm -hmm. That they're going to come back with something that we can digest. Um, I'm not committing to a ten, and I'm not mm -hmm. committing no, to the bonding. I'm not committing to any of that right now. But I'm telling Greg and Dan they can proceed to figure out ways that we can get through where these staffing and budget pressures are going to pinch us. But they're asking us if we're okay with that within just a little variance. That is what they're asking us. And it's a fair question. Well, they I, I don't deny that that's a fair them. question. It is a fair question. <laughs> And that's why I asked to be very blunt. What are you asking us for? And that is what we are being asked. They have to have a starting point someplace. I, and I, the, I and, get it. And the financial uh, pressures that you have ran the different models says this is a starting point. And it may go down. I said sharpen your pencils uh, during the break. And uh, staff, you have done all of that in the past, and things come down low. But there has to be a starting point for them to move forward. Or we don't. Dan Kay, what are your thoughts? Are you OK with staff doing their work and coming back? We're not making any, uh, to Vince's point, we're not well, saying 10% is the t it's I just want to go back to what uh, Interim City Manager Greg Lindbergh said. <laughs> I think I have to do that to get through. Um, and that is, he's looking for uh, maybe more of a scope range yeah. because he doesn't want to walk away thinking 10 is okay, work with staff, and then come back two months later and say seven's the number, and then have to go back and retool everything. Yes. I, I mean, I heard that loud and clear yeah. from Greg. Yes. So it's a little Gardner's. less about just move, keep going in that direction, and a little bit more about what are you comfortable with, which is, to yes. Councilmember Schultz's point, kind of feels like a max tax vote. It's not, but it feels yeah. like we're already setting that cap, right, in some in some way, fashion, right, uh, some some number. Um, so I'm 100% comfortable with the debt. I can commit to that right now. I, I think we need to turn to debt just like we did in the Great Recession mm -hmm. to mitigate the levy. We're adding another million dollars against my preference. I would still propose my proposal, but I understand there's no support. So uh, moving forward, we're adding another million out of ARPA to buy down what was a 5.7. That buys it down quite a bit more, but now we're ending up all the way to 10. And the reason is, is we have all of this additional staff that's <clears throat> that's proposed, and I think there's justification for all of it. Um, but there's also a full funding of the EDA in there, which I will not vote for. So there's a couple of points off the ten right there. So I think we're at eight, and there may be ability to shave it to seven or seven and a half. So is ten the right starting point? It's like it's like okay because I'm not going to vote for two points in it that I know of right now. Uh, so it's not going to be ten in my mind. 
Yeah. So no. I, I'm comfortable right. with the framework of the direction, yeah. but I don't want 10 used to Kara's point. I don't want 10 uses like that's okay. No, I don't think <laughs> Greg and Dan T, I don't think you believe that we're sitting here saying, oh, 10 is going to be the number because <laughs> Madam Mayor, members of the council, no. To yeah. Greg's point, what we're looking for really are guardrails mm -hmm. uh, to establish expectations moving forward. Yeah. Uh, in any of these conversations, it is incumbent upon staff to exercise our diligence to try to get these numbers down as low and as reasonable as possible with the confines that we've discussed, both from a strategic standpoint and also a financial viability and advisable yeah. standpoint. Uh, I can tell you, if the council were to express the consensus tonight that they're generally comfortable with this framework, and I don't want to necessarily speak for the city manager, but my expectation would be is we wouldn't leave this room trying to hit 10%. That's not the goal. No. Um, what we've done already, and even just working through this for a few weeks, is shaved off 1% already, 0.9 admittedly. It's a little less than one. but um, And there may be other scenarios that we could explore. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that's what the council would do, but to Council Member Keeley's point, if it's not a three-year phase in the VDA, maybe it's a five-year phase in, or some variation on that to consider other scenarios. And we can explore those things with the council in future meetings, but to put those discussions together, as was mentioned, we just need some kind of starting point. Um, and we're admittedly flying a little blind with some of the questions, just because we are early in the process. Uh, but I think we can come back reasonably with something else, understanding that there's all of these things that are yet to land, and there's all these things that are yet to happen. Uh, and we can be working towards it in an iterative fashion because you're gonna hear about the organizational analysis, you're gonna hear about the facility study, and we'll get feedback from you as it goes. And when it comes time to talk to you in August, we'll have those things. We can be very thoughtful about making sure those discussions have budget components included in them, so there's check-ins along the way. Um, but again, that we're generally working off this framework back to the kind of joke I made before, under the guise that there are no surprises. Yep. That we're all using this common frame of reference. It's not, we're not trying to set any maximum property tax. We just want to make sure that we are beginning from something that is reasonable, understanding that it's not final, and there may be additional concerns and considerations in total disclosure, both known and unknown at this point in time. To yeah, Dan, just for some clarity, to Council Member Keeley's question about the general fund levy increase and the EDA, can can you revisit for a second um, the distinction between the staff recommendation or the financial management plan in terms of the EDA levy and the general fund levy? I want to make sure that we we are walking out of this room with an abundance of clarity uh, okay. about those two about those two yeah. levies. But it comes down to that one number. It'll all be rolled into one number, and as the council may recall, it's always broken out in the budget presentations and the budget documents. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point in time, what would really be proposed for the EDA itself under the current plan would be a million dollars or a $23 increase in the levy for 2023, and then getting it, the city up to the statutory maximum over a three-year period uh, with the goal of trying to build a reasonable fund balance really by the end of what ends up being mm -hmm. a decade. Um, with respect to the FTEs, those are primarily funded out of the general fund and would be handled mm -hmm. by the general fund levy increase. Uh, we don't at this point in time, uh, and we can certainly provide to the council, have a, a breakdown of the percentage increase by fund that can certainly be provided. Uh, for the points of discussion in this meeting and just to make the um, conversation flow a little bit, we collapse them all into one. But we could certainly look at what are the changes, for example, on the infrastructure trust fund because we put in three million of bonding and then right. how we're feathering it out through the following year. <coughs> but it's all in the general fund at this point in time, those 12.5 and then the handful more are in the enterprise funds. And candidly, we haven't, we haven't begun necessarily the budget process on the enterprise funds at this okay. point in time. Kara? So the 10% that we are being asked about tonight does or does not include the EDA fund levy. It does. It does. It does. It does. That's what I, okay. I, that's what I understood. Does. And I just wanted to make sure that, very that clear, right? the 10% <laughs> includes that $23 or $1 million. This is the Cadillac plan. Yeah. <laughs> it's the all-inclusive. 
I, but here's the thing. I don't necessarily think that this is the Cadillac plan or the all-inclusive. This is the restrained Cadillac plan. Do you? It's just getting the job done, Vince. Well, Dan yeah. said they cut I mean, a point it's off It's of just it, getting so the job done. Cadillac plan. $23 a year is not a Cadillac plan. Council when you Schultz. look at other I, I'm cities. talking about the 10%. I, like, I, I don't. To your question, this is our, this is our best good faith effort with the information in front of the council that we have right now right. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to provide some context to the conversation. To your point, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I, I understand mean, your feedback. Yeah. I, do, I, I, I don't think that what is being proposed right now is, is a Cadillac plan. I said that I, I, and I no I get I get that I get that but I you know just so we're clear like I don't I don't think that this is like everyone you know this is the sky's the limit type of type of ask I don't I don't think that's what we're seeing um, and so that that's why I guess I'm not taking this as fluidly And and I okay. So. I do I do okay. So ARPA, fine. Throw her on in like that. I that I can give an answer on what I'm <coughs> what I'm comfortable with and what I feel like I have enough information to give good feedback and guidance on that that I think you can rely on. Um, but the other ones, no, I I don't. I just don't. All right, but uh, um, do I have consensus for staff to proceed uh, with the information that we received tonight, knowing that 10% is not is not the uh, the max tax, uh, but you it's 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 an area that you start. And that it can come down. We were not even if you, you take if you, even if you reduce if you reduce the um, the the one million that you have in the ten percent, you'll come back and that that'll be reduced. And then everything else that's going to come out of the discussions with all of the department heads, and then all of the other parts that are still uh, within the mix that you're going to evaluate. But you need a place to start. Well, it's going to yeah. be up to us to determine yeah. what that final is. And Dan has proven that he is very good at providing us information, information that I've not seen the lengths of in the three years that I've been doing this. Agreed. So yeah. it's going to be up to us to say, yeah. here's what 10 looks like, here's what X looks like. What Greg's yeah. saying is don't blindside us yeah. um, and come in and ask for a three. Yeah. So. I think I'm in. I'm more than comfortable to proceed with these bumpers, bumpers. But what are guard the bumpers? Rails. Yeah. Guard rails. <laughs> guard rails. <laughs> Bumper rails. But what are the guard rails, though? I mean, okay, so we know it's not three, and we know it's not ten, and that's what they're asking us for is, what are those guard rails? That's a pretty wide range. Council Member Schultz, to, to your question, um, last year and the current budget policy direction that we have is a 5.7% incre increase to maintain 2021 level operations, keep the lights on, status quo, for the next four years. Mm -hmm. So that if, if we want to use the bumper analogy, the low end bumper, in my mind, the floor is 5.7%. Yeah. And what that buys you is 2021 operations, 2021 staffing levels no increase for inflation, and I will have to come back to you with some very hard news at 5.7%. Mm -hmm. So then what, my other my other bumper, high, my right? other commitment is 10% right now. So that I, I feel strongly that the work of Ellers reflects, I'm going to use a word that's going to be unpopular, a conservative small c. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, our, our best analysis right now of what our financial future looks like, and at 10%, we can accomplish a lot of what we've talked about in terms of your strategic priorities, mainly staffing. Um, I, I agree with you, Council Member Schultz, and I, I will come back to the council with a discussion on service level because we need it. Yeah. All yeah. of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
so th there are some questions there. And kind of <coughs> as an aside, the facilities fund, there's a lot of debt proposed there for $26 million of, in placeholders of projects. That's what the phase three work that Garrett's leading is all about. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to narrow that conversation down. Yeah. Right now, I'm comfortable saying that the two guardrails would be 5.7% at the low end, 10, 10 at the that. high end. And it, at some point in time through this process, it's going to moderate somewhere in that range. Yeah. What I can't commit yeah. to is lower than 5.7% because at the right. end of the day, I have just, we have Nothing. just general 2021 operational level <laughs> at 5.7% for the next four years, or we're gonna have to make some pretty difficult well, and you're not taking into consideration all of the increases in everything from gasoline to, well, Inflation is going to be a pressure. The economy is a pressure. And you, we all Economic know. Economic inflation. We all know that. There is some uncertainty right now that we tried to capture at the yeah. front end of tonight. This really is a max tax discussion. It's a range. It is. It's a range discussion. Yeah. So are you comfortable with the range? I mean, it's something they have to... They have to have something to work on. Mm. So you come I think five to ten, and they're they've got to do their work. I know I don't want to face that cliff that we learned about yeah. at five point seven right. for the next yeah. three, and that's what prompted this whole process was that financial cliff that we were looking at. And the I want to make sure that we are structurally financially sound. That's our responsibility of, stu of being stewards of the public's trust. I, I will say, Councilmember Workman, Mayor Kautz, to your point, um, oh, so. it's not my preference uh, for, for you, for myself, for our leadership team to come to you tonight and suggest that a 10% property tax levy increase is, is necessary. Um, it's not particularly the place that I would choose. But, um, uh, and I hear your feedback and I, I value your perspective. And, and I, will, I will also say that um, uh, Councilmember Workman, while I've uh, cautioned all of our leadership not to use the word cliff, <laughs> uh, you, you, make a, you make a good point in that I asked Ellers to come in and help us yes. to put together a 10-year financial management plan yeah. that solved what I heard you ask in January, yes. which is we need more information, we want better transparency, yeah. we want your, the entirety of our team to be involved, uh, and we want you to give us the information that we need even when you know it's going to be incredibly unpopular. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that's what I've tried to accomplish here. And I, I hear your feedback. I, yeah. I take it all very seriously uh, across the spectrum yeah. of what I've heard tonight. Um, and what I want to do is continue to put good information in front of you. Um, and I by no means am asking you to, to vote on or give me direction yeah. on max tax. I, I I'm trying to figure out how we, how we narrow this conversation down and get us to a better place than we were last year, frankly. And Greg, I want to just thank you for your leadership and what you've done what you've done because in January when we sat down and had the all day work session we said that we're going to do this together and we needed more transparency and we all need to understand um, our financial pressures going forward and you're doing that and so I want to thank Ellers the Ellers team in helping us to get to um, where we need to be and this is not easy stuff for us. It's never easy. Um, but it's where we need to have the confidence and the courage to do what we are called to do as stewards of the public's trust of the city of Burnsville. So I'm, I'm hearing you say that you're comfortable with the direction that yep. staff has. And um, Dan Kay, are you comfortable with the direction to move forward? Because I'm not sure. Yeah, based on comments yeah. that we've made, yeah, there's yeah. no reason to restate it. And Kara, I know you still have some hesitancy. I do. I, I, I do have some hesitancy, but, but I do have some hesitancy. I do think this is a backdoor max tax. I 100% do, because it is. Now we're saying 
you can go between this range and this range and damn, what is a max tax? It's saying you can't go higher than this amount. That's exactly what it is. Um, but the other thing that I don't want to have happen is, is that we're not, we're not being clear and we're trying to give a soft answer. Well, you know, maybe, I mean, kind of, sort of. Um, and then we have staff do work based on assumptions and then we come back and we're like, and it's seven. That's, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. So, yep. like, those are my, those are my concerns. three areas of concern that I have. So let's make sure that those areas of concern are recognized, but we need staff. And I know they're going to get the information to us. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I, I just and, wish we would. And you've already spoken that you're okay understanding mm -hmm. all of this. So there's consensus, <laughs> Greg, for you and, and Matt and staff to move on. Okay. And you have uh, Kara's concerns, and so those are some of the things that you're going to take a look at. And staff, as you take a look at your budgets and all of that, uh, all of the services that you provide, those are some of the things that uh, uh, Councilmember Schultz and perhaps all of us need to know. What are those services? And um, how are they prioritized? Last thing I'll mention is Greg's been in this seat before and knows what this feels like. And um, I appreciate that about Greg. And I know that he knows what this feels like. And um, I'm not saying I'm tossing him the keys to the car, but I, I know he's going to do a good job and he's listening to what we're saying. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And, um, I, I, and it's not you. lost on us that uh, you're two doing two jobs. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not lost on me. It's not lost on me either that uh, you're doing a lot of work and you're bringing in resources that will help us get to excellence and best practice. I, I will ask the council for just one more thing and I understand <laughs> that it is 944. <laughs> um, <laughs> does the group want to add another meeting in May uh, to talk more about where we're at, yes. or are yeah. you okay? Absolutely. Yeah. You would like I'm, to add a okay okay meeting? Right. Yes. I do if we will have more information, but if we're not going to have the information, there really is. Can you go back to your schedule? It would it would be better in that case that then we it's look to June. to me. It would yeah. be better in that case that we look to June, and I can use one on ones and other. Be better. Yeah. Other people. Yeah. I mean, because one of the things is that I want to make really sure that you're having your meeting with department heads, and that's not until July. Correct. And I, I will be informing the council because of they're this. because they're going to start working on their budgets, and they sit down and talk with you then about what their needs are. It's really two and a half month spread. Between yeah. The no, and, and that's what I mean. They're not. He's not going to be meeting yeah. with them until. July, but they have that time to work on their budgets sure. before they sit down. I'm just saying it's maybe between now and June 1st, uh, 21st, sorry, would there be a late May or early Ju June meeting time that could precede the 21st? Because th that is two and a half months. And I was, I, was send I was sensing some hesitancy on kind of both sides of the conversation tonight. That might be too much of a gap. Yeah. Um, I am also sensitive to the fact that I will meet with this group of people tomorrow promptly at 10 a.m. and they will all cut me off at the knees for <laughs> suggesting another meeting. Right. Um, uh -huh. I might just and show up too to help. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all in this together. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> and I, wa I want to be honest to the commitment that we all have made together, which is we're going to communicate as a group about our budget yeah. intentionally. Yeah. Um, so I, I, just, I, I pose the question not to make friends or enemies, but to, to make sure that you all are comfortable. And, and perhaps that conversation could be more department-oriented presentations on what they're working on and their individual challenges as they're, because my plan with the direction I have tonight is to direct them to start crafting their budgets. Um, we, we could put some departmental communication in there if the council desires it. Yeah. I don't need an answer right now. I can follow up with you. Mm -hmm. 
Madam and Madam I'm hearing that. Go ahead. Oh, members of the council, just by by way of a, a recommendation, I don't mean to be so nebulous about it, but I'm looking through the individual studies, and we've heard, you know, there are some July, June, and August time frames. If the council would be agreeable to at least understanding that maybe we could have some flexibility and perhaps schedule a budget meeting when some of these things land, maybe not necessarily agree to a timeline right now, but mm -hmm. if we yeah. get new information and when, about these, it. and so yep. just you might know that we may. Good lack of a better phrase, fling a budget meeting at you. If yeah. some of these things kind of show up, yeah. we can do a more prompt check-in, but in the interest of excellence, not necessarily rushing into the other work that's occurring yes. that's a great to suggestion. get to yes. a budget that's a great meeting. Yeah, that's good. And in, staff, in you're okay with all of that too? I mean, this just adds more time to you guys. I really appreciate they're, that they're you okay. take it. Yeah, they're, they're okay with it until tomorrow. Yeah, they're gonna really <laughs> take care of it. <laughs> Now I understand why Greg sat all the way over these. here, that yeah. far away from you, yeah. so you couldn't be hitting so the tomorrow, body language. But I really appreciate that you're, you know, you've been working a full day and you're here, um, and and we're doing this together. But we're going to do it better together, and and your voices will be heard. I pro for me, your voices will be heard. Maybe we'll be fed. Uh, we will make sure that we address that issue. We had Council food, we had yeah. crackers, and yeah, healthy snacks. A whole lot of people didn't get dinner done. It's a strategic initiative. Well, and and I would like to say to everyone, <coughs> happy first contact day. <laughs> I get the reference. Thank you. <laughs> me, me, me too. <laughs> I don't. Thank, thank you all. This was is a long meeting. Yeah. It was productive. Okay, okay. if everybody is okay, right. then I will adjourn us by acclamation. Uh, I say, Good. oh no, we're not done. Can I just want to uh, have a chance to echo what the staff has said and um, uh, and other council members. Uh, this process is 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 so refreshingly great in so many ways. Yeah. And and uh, I'm glad to hear that and it's been hearing the same from uh, for the uh, staff department heads perspective as well. But it all starts at the top, and the leadership that Greg has yeah. provided in in a very short amount of time being put into this position has been nothing short of uh, like yeah. I don't think he sleeps. I think he works seven days a week to pull all this off. And uh, we need to get on some decisions very quickly here. And uh, yeah, um, which we are on. We're, the we're yeah, working on that. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank work. you all. Every, anything else? Anything else anybody wants to say? And you can take him off at the knees tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not the best way to put it. That's what came to mind. Councilmember Keeley, thank you. I, this is reflective of a team effort. Um, Dan has been absolutely terrific in leading uh, alongside the rest of this group. Um, it'll be great time. when he's our employee and he's doing it next time. <laughs> well, then we yeah, better make I'm sure not getting in the middle of that. We better that. make sure he wants to. You can't him. have him. <laughs> <laughs> you know we're going over budgets <laughs> now. Dan, always, always happy to be come part back of our organization help. somehow. There you go. Thank well, Gene, if we can't have him, maybe we'll just continue to use him. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Anything else? Uh, then we are adjourned by acclamation. And thank you so much, everybody. You guys are the greatest. Okay.